Hey everybody, welcome to another live stream of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. Thanks for joining us on Facebook today. Uh, we're not on YouTube, but hopefully we'll get that figured out this week. Uh, so then next week we can join you live from there as well. Uh, we're a day early here. Chad's off to vacation soon. Mm -hmm. So True. hopefully uh, it's not throwing off your schedules too much here. But uh, yes, uh, we're excited you're with us. You can send in any questions that you have throughout the podcast, actually. You just throw those in the comments section there on Facebook, and then we'll get to those questions that you may have and we'll be able to answer as many of them as possible uh, toward the end of the podcast. And with that, let's get into the proper podcast. All right. Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with our head coach, Chad Timmerman. Hey everybody. And our CEO, Nate Pearson. Hello. And we're going to answer more of those cycling and triathlon related questions today. You can submit them at trainerroad.com slash podcast. Uh, before we get into things, Chad, your hat's uh, very appropriate. We've got a lot of things to talk about because he's got the local racing organization's hat on there, Reno mm -hmm. Wheelman. Um, we're going to talk about a bunch of uh, or a handful of things before we get into some questions that uh, whether it be corrections or whether it be uh, things that we've learned from racing last night, plenty of stuff. Uh, we'll share all that stuff. Uh, but first, Chad, uh, I think you wanted to talk about some of the end of ride sprints. Yeah, just just to wrap up something we talked about a couple weeks ago where someone was asking if it's beneficial to finish a ride with uh, hard efforts, sprint efforts. And I said, uh, certainly from a psycholo psychological perspective, knowing that you can muster a really high intensity a meaningful sprint at the end of what would be an otherwise depleting ride. Mm. And and I didn't really have any physiological backup for it or any reasons why you would want to train that way. But I did come across uh, a, a study by Martin Jabala a while back that talked about how you finish a ride can, can set off a different signaling cascade in terms of adaptive uh, signals down at the genetic level. Mm -hmm. so, so for instance, if you do hard efforts at the beginning of a long ride and then you do a couple hours of endurance, all those uh, signal, uh, all the signaling that was taking place, all the the genes that switched on after the sprints is long gone. Whereas mm -hmm. if you finish that long ride with those sprints, those genes are switched on. So you can get a sl slightly different adaptive effect depending on how you close a ride. So then everyone who does like their long ride, a group ride, and it's kind of slow, and at the end they sprint. Mm -hmm. Could that be counterproductive depending yeah, I, on what they're going for? I don't know. And I need to find the study itself and go over it. I don't know if it went into that aspect of it. Yeah. But if you're trying to, you know, cause an uptick in some sort of adaptive response and you, you, you want to be one of the guys who can punch at the end of a sprint or you just you're working on your sprint and you want that signaling to be more prominent during your recovery mm -hmm. period after after the ride, then maybe finish with those end of, end of ride sprints. Interesting. Kind of like a, a bonus if it's exactly what you're going for, mm -hmm. maybe. Huh. Interesting stuff. Uh, one thing I need to clarify on was last week when we were talking about wheel size, uh, we were talking about the 29 inch versus seven or versus 27 and a half and 700 versus 650 B respectively. And <clears throat> something that I mentioned was that the, the constraining diameter, when we're talking about tires and if they fit, that's your bead seat diameter. And that doesn't necessarily measure 29 inches. Uh, 29 inches is roughly what the outside of the tire would measure. So that bead seat diameter though, is the important thing that we're talking about. That's the constraining measurement. And that basically just means where your tire sits on the rim as in like the tire itself, where it butts up to the rim. So how, how big is that then on the 29? Well, that's just the thing. It's, it's, it does have a specific measurement. However, that does still fluctuate within a small amount. Is that why some, um, some like combos are hard to seat and yeah. everyone swears at mm -hmm. them because like this, it's like a little bit too big or too I would think small. Of, yeah. The or too they small? have, it could when be too small. Oh yeah. You're right. Too small. To wrestle it on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also a lot of what makes a tire harder to put on, I find is the, the height of the rim walls. So there's mm. like where, cause your tire rests inside oh, yeah. those walls. Right. And some rim manufacturers make those walls a little taller. Just it seems slightly taller. And that yeah. makes all the difference. And it can make things pretty And tough. the combo of tire too. Yes. It's yeah, all, totally. yeah. and I think we said this before, but putting your tire in the sun helps a ton. Mm -hmm. I used a hairdryer once. Totally works. Save me. Yep. We bought a heat gun here. I haven't used it yet. That's probably overkill. Uh, you know, you just have to be careful with the heat gun. Yeah. Like you have to understand they get really hot. You can melt but your tire. All mm -hmm. winter, I use the heat gun in my garage to put on tires. And it's amazing. You can, f in many cases, uh, tires that have been like really difficult to mount and I need like a compressor and I need the stars to align. Yeah. If I heat gun the thing, I can put it on with a, with a floor pump and it's no problem. Yeah. So it's it making that tire much more pliable and soft can really help. What's your um, technique then? to uh to like warm up the tire yeah so i never stay in a single spot 
and then I just work my way around in circles. It's also a good opportunity for you to do some like shoulder exercises, but you just kind of, I put the tire down on the ground and then I just, and I don't do it in the house. You don't want to do it on any surfaces you care about. Right. But, and then I just continually move around until that tire gets hot to touch. Like when you touch it, it feels too hot for a bit. And then by that time, it'll probably cool off just enough by the time you get the wheel there and in place that you can put it on and it'll really be good. Cool. So yeah, good it's tip. a good help. Heat guns are cheap too. They're really cheap. I think that I got the one that the one that I got on Amazon was like 13 bucks. It was like wow. really cheap. Hopefully it doesn't burn my house down or something for being that cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unplug it when you're yeah, not so, using it. Exactly. Uh, Nate, then you also had. Yeah, I said, coffee. I was talking about the coffee that's like the best coffee you've had. Mm-hmm. And I called them third world coffee shops. <laughs> it's called third they wave. They have those too, I think. <laughs> third yeah, wave yeah, coffee yeah, shops. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe third the third way. world ones are even better. Yeah. <laughs> like, who knows? Yeah. I, I, at first, I almost thought you were talking about a local coffee shop called Old World Coffee that we have that's really yeah, famous. Yeah. That's maybe why I got it. Con- yeah. I don't yeah. Know. That yeah. might have been why. Might be because yeah. I'm dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. Um, and then a lot of folks were sending in questions this week uh, that are from down <clears throat> under uh, in Australia or in New Zealand or in Chile or in Brazil, Southern Hemisphere, basically, uh, that y'all are going into your fall and your off season, so to speak. So we just wanted to, rather than addressing, you know, individual questions and, and making a whole episode about that, it's something that we t- we've talked about quite a lot. However, we totally get that, you know, this sort of thing merits, you know, readdressing all the time. Uh, so off season training, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And we kind of boiled it down to like two main things that you'll want to, that you you'll want to consider Two big considerations, yeah. basically what you'll want to do with that time, because you can look at the off season is like, uh, man, if you've raced a ton and you're psychologically spent Mm -hmm. and you're everything else, maybe just some time off is okay and it's good for you. Um, But if you are looking at that off season and you're you're eager to still make some improvements, maybe take some time away from the typical routine but still make some improvements, Mm -hmm. you can still do some more stuff, right, Chad? Yeah, absolutely. And I think addressing strengths and weaknesses probably applies a bit more to a multi-sport athlete than Mm -hmm. a cyclist Mm -hmm. because a a cyclist who has a weak sprint isn't going to spend his off season working on the sprint necessarily. I mean, that's not the sort of power you train that far out from your events. Mm -hmm. Whereas a multi-sport triathlete who maybe needs to focus more on the bike or on the run or on the swim, whatever, can shift emphasis to that particular discipline and simply maintain the other two. It's almost always swim. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. Yep. And and that makes, that makes good sense in a lot of ways too, because that's the least impactful on the body. It's it's the easiest one to, it's really hard to overdo swimming. It's yeah. In, In terms of cycling and strengths and weaknesses, I think one weakness that's not necessarily fitness related, but, um, bike handling is something that you can really work on. Yeah. Why are you looking and at me? No, because, and I'm looking at you because you've mentioned <laughs> you've how good that, cross right? has been for yeah. you Yeah. and cross happens in the fall, yep. typically, you know, the off season. Um, so I was just, I was basically giving you a T-ball pitch for that one. So then you'd be able to, to hit that one out of the park, but you focused on your weakness being bike handling with cyclocross and you said it helped, right? Yep. It's still my weakness, but it is a, a less of a weakness. You're pedaling through turns quite well in the crit yesterday. So yeah, it's uh, pretty good. That one, we'll talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Ad nauseum. Yeah, we, yeah, we definitely that. will. So that's one thing. You can work on your, your, your bike handling skills. Mm-hmm. Um, you could even take this time in the off season to like, if you're really competitive and really focused on things and you feel like, you know, mentally you're being held back. I've worked with a, with a, with a mental coach before, and it's been really helpful. Mm. Uh, that was in my motocross days. Uh, maybe you spend some time where you're focusing on that. I just picture his uh, therapist being his mental coach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're yeah, not my yeah. therapist. You're my mental coach. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, it was a therapist. That's for sure. Um, psychologist, sports psychologist. So, It can be really helpful too. Like basically I think it's a good time to sit back, take inventory, see what you can improve. And like Chad said, Mm -hmm. if you're in terms of fitness, there are definitely, you know, a number of different things that you can, you can take care of, but. Yeah. And then in terms of the duration of your off season and and talking more about a uh, transition period, Mm -hmm. you know, whether you're going to spend some time off the bike or you're just going to tone things way down. Um, base that on a few factors. One is how hard your season is, how, how run down you feel coming into this transition period is going to dictate just how long you need away from the bike or away from structured training. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to stop riding. I mean, plenty of people just shift, uh, you know, roadies start doing some mountain bike rides. Maybe they uh, don't even, I don't think they remove the power meter if they have one, but you know, the power is not a concern whatsoever. They right. just go out and ride for the pleasure of it. And that, and that could be enough, enough distance on, um, what you're used to and what's kind of running you down and, and it could be sufficient. Other people want to spend time entirely away from sport mm-hmm. and take time off. But the concern there is, you know, how much fitness are you going to lose in the process, which is less of a concern when, when your training age is higher. So you've been doing this for 
in my case, mm. going on 30 years, it's a lot easier for me to get back into a high level of fitness than someone who's been doing it for two or three years. Mm -hmm. So that is absolutely a concern. And then of course you have to consider, you know, how many seasons are you packing into a year? Are you going straight from mountain bike to road to cross and then back <laughs> to, in which case you really can never get too far from, or you don't want to get too far from a reasonably high level of fitness. Yeah. And some people on ter in terms of the training side, maybe they just really want to do like sweet spot work, or maybe they just really want to do a certain type of work that they find motivation and enjoyable sure. and they haven't done. And that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. um, totally okay. Like, I think that if you take that approach, you just have to keep in mind, like make sure that you're getting a, a, any benefit that you feel like you need from getting a reset, so to speak, whatever that may be. And sweet spot, it, don't knock sweet spot. I've got no. The, the fittest I was was when I would just do fits. Don't, don't knock Because you spot. can There's, do so much of it. Yeah. You don't get tired. That's a great way to build a road yeah. base. I mean, it's mm -hmm. at the higher end of things, so you can't do quite as much of it. And mm -hmm. it does take a bigger toll. And it, it's harder, plain and simple. Mm -hmm. But it can, I mean, it just pushes that lactate threshold up, 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 You can up. still do a lot of it, though, and it hurts a lot less than mm -hmm. totally. lactate. VO2 max. Yeah, VO2 max or, like. or threshold work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a great option. So hopefully that gives you some, some guidance there on the off season. A lot of people have asked like, how do I, how many days do I cut away from my typical training schedule? Like, or how should I reduce it? Everything else, mm -hmm. really a lot of that, you're going to have to figure out what the best is uh, for you personally. You'll have to see number one, set priorities, basically say, what do I want to get out of an off season? And then based off of those, th those priorities that you have and the things that you're going for with your off season, that's how you can make adjustments. As we always say though, don't risk putting yourself in too much of a hole because it's always harder to get yourself out of a hole than it is, you know, something else. So if you're crazy ambitious, but something that voice in your head is saying that maybe you shouldn't just treat your off season as like a really hard training block. Yeah. Maybe you should take you gotta a come into your training season and your competitive seasons refreshed and, and motivated. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, you're starting from mm -hmm. a really difficult place. Mm -hmm. And I know you guys give me poo poo about this, but mm -hmm. I, I really think if I didn't do those two training camps, I would have been fine. Like we oh. talk about, you always said, said I did too much. We've talked about the podcast a lot, oh, but I, I did. Saying. Those two, are what led to illness. Exactly. It, it was yeah. just doubling the TSS. Oh, I believe that. Um, oh yeah. It was yeah, just I too much. Argue that. Huge spikes. Yep. Yeah. Those are, yeah. So it's like, uh, yeah, you can find yourself in a hole and it's tough to get yeah, yeah. out of it. <laughs> and it's not, I mean, it's just not the training. It's one of those big events that you do. I didn't mm -hmm. plan for it well enough ahead of time mm -hmm. or afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and another thing too, that uh, another common question that we've been getting recently is how to incorporate outdoor rides into your training plan. Uh, we just spent last week talking uh, for a good amount of time. And you can see the live stream about some exciting new features that we released with trainer road that we call performance analytics, where you can analyze your outdoor rides on trainer road. Um, and I guess that basically we'll, we can just cover the basics. Really, uh, it's common to substitute an outdoor ride in for a scheduled ride that you may have. Uh, once the thing that I usually say is if you want the most precise effect that or desired effect that's prescribed by your training plan, then you follow the training plan to a T. Uh, but that said, there are certain things that you can glean from those outside rides that you can't glean, uh, or, and I should say productive outside rides. I mean, like races, group rides, those sort of things, uh, that you can't glean from others. So. Uh, you can replace it. And then we've always usually, you know, I encourage people to keep in mind the training stress that you're getting from this sort of workout in terms of the number, but then also the type of work that you're doing and see, you might have to make some adjustments, dial back the following week. If you went a little too hard during that group ride or uh, something else like that, but it makes it a whole lot easier now with those features, you can actually see the training stress. So, yeah. um, on the website or the app, you mm -hmm. can click a button on your plan and you can assign the outside ride to your training plan. So it's you probably get credit a feature that not a lot of people, not enough people know about too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, now absolutely. they do. <laughs> Hopefully <laughs> you can. Yeah. So you can assign those as an outdoor ride and they're all in trainer road now. It's pretty handy. So, um, another thing I wanted to mention too, we got a few, uh, questions that I just wanted to cover. And some people were like, Hey, uh, I was looking at, I like love these new features, but I'm looking at my best all time, best power stuff. And I have a sprint that's like 4,068 Watts. And it was from a, a power meter that was poorly calibrated or something like that. And you can actually go in and remove that ride from your personal record history right now with trainer road. You just go to the ride and you click on those three dots and then you can just, there are check boxes that come up there when you edit that ride, so to speak, and you can just remove it from personal records. So it's an easy fix uh, for anybody looking for that. Uh, with that, I think that we should get into the criterion we did last night. We raced right last night. Yeah. USAC race. 
Yes, mm -hmm. which locally, so um, as a precursor to this, we have a local race series. That, it's a weekly race series that happens, uh, tons of fun, good races, uh, but they haven't been USAC sanctioned in probably five years. It's been a long time. No, more than that. Yeah, more than, more than 10. That. Yeah. Wow. Maybe more time. than 11, actually. I don't remember the last time they were USAC sanctioned. Yeah. And Chad's super old, so. <laughs> <laughs> he just said he's been doing it for 30 years. Been around the block a few times, yeah. 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 He's been here for 30 years and he right. can't remember, yeah. yeah. So it's it's been a long Sorry, time. Chad. Um, but we've got I'm proud of my <laughs> as you should be. <laughs> um, but you've got now we've got sanctioning on these races. So uh, where we're at, we're in a town called Reno, Nevada, or a city called Reno, Nevada, and that's about an hour and a half to two hours from Sacramento. And in the Sacramento Valley and the Bay Area is where the majority of our sanctioned racing goes on in our region. Yeah, our easiest get would be Auburn, which is about an hour and a half away. Yeah, and they don't have many races in Auburn. No. I think it's one or two a year, right? So for us to, to get over the hill and get to get USAC points, it ends up being a pretty substantial investment in time and even in money because, mm -hmm. you know, you spend mm -hmm. gas going across the hill. And then if you're like an early category or like a low category, or I should say like a cat five, cat four beginner category stuff, you race at like 7 a.m. So you can't feasibly like get Probably in a solid preparation. An overnight stay, mm -hmm. yeah, which is ratchets up the cost pretty substantially. Which is hard. A lot of it's places tricky. have this, so mm -hmm. we're lucky. Uh -huh. Yeah, and now we have it here, uh, at least in some of our races, they're USAC sanctioned and they're paying points. So you, typically it's just ABC, not sanctioned. And I usually race in the A's, Chad races in the A's. Nate, you're an A racer too, at least in now. terms of, yeah, now. Now, now I am, sure. I yeah. was a B racer. Yeah, <clears throat> so, and then uh, that's usually how it works out. C being beginner, A being the expert guys. But last night it was a little different because we had the sanctioning. So the C's were five, four, three. No, four, five. Four, four five. five. And then the B's were three, four, five. Yep. And then the A's were one, two, three. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking just so everyone doesn't get confused, we should on the rest of this podcast, just can talk about it as the four, five race, the three, four, five race and the one, sure. two, three, because everyone's familiar with that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But the beauty of that is not only do we have some uh, neighborhood or backyard USAC sanctioned races, but those overlapping categories allow racers who are really trying to get points and get race starts mm -hmm. to accumulate uh, a couple races or, you know, to, to double up. Which is why awesome. Jonathan and I re-raced both the four, five and the three, four, five race. Yes, we did. <laughs> and Chad's too high of a category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I'm a two, so all I can do is a one, two, three. And yep. Jonathan, you were four, mm -hmm. um, so he's a one in mountain biking. And yeah. actually, even the race promoter before is like, we got some sandbaggers in here. <laughs> well, you're not sandbagging because you really like. I can't help it. Exactly. Yeah. Sandbag, yeah. It's, oh, it's, we should clarify that term. We should. Because that drives me nuts and people call people sandbaggers. It, if, if a person voluntarily races lower, than they should be, then that's sandbagging. If they are not allowed to race in a different category than they are allowed to race, yeah. then they have no choice. It's not sandbagging. Yeah, For instance, it if this was not a sanctioned race and Chad went down to the sea racers, yeah. that would be sandbagging. sandbagging. And everyone would yell at him and say, Chad, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> and be rightfully and mm -hmm. rightfully so, right? Um, but in this case, you know, not not a sandbagger, but his, in, his point was that there are faster racers than what you would typically find in this group. Yeah. Um, and don't let any of these idiots cajole you into upgrading sooner than, oh, than yeah. is necessary and, and refer to you as a sandbagger just because you're achieving some certain level of success. It's yeah. okay to have some race wins and get a few more race wins before you're forced into that upgrade. That's a good point. It's the box of crabs theory, as they say down in Chile. What's so they that? say that basically is everyone climbs on top of each other to get success. And when one person gets over the wall, they all get angry and pull that person down, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like uh, everyone in that group, when, you're, when you join that group and you have one bit of success then they're like get out of here they're angry it's the at opposite you, the right? crabs want to push you out yes <laughs> get <laughs> out of here right, right. <laughs> It's like, but they get angry at you and they think that like you, you know, one time you ruin success, it for the rest of us. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah, exactly. And it's not, um, it's not like that. You have to learn how to, and the thing is a successful race win in one category may be very differently earned than it will be in another category. Yeah, I'll tell you, you, so. you go from fives to fours to threes and everything kind of flows pretty evenly and you can get little bits of success here and there and score some wins and some podium finishes, high placements. You get into that one, two category yes. and say goodbye to all of that. It's different. Those, the, the wins, even little bits of success are going to be so few and far between. The tactics are entirely different too, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which probably segues what segues into, should we go through each race? Because we all raced each race. And I think yeah. we learned 
No, let's not do a whole race report. Totally not. But let's do uh, the learnings from each one. Yeah, takeaways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, in the first race that we did, uh, we'll start with that one. That's the that's the three four five race. Four five race. <clears throat> four five race. Forgive me. This is going to get tricky with all those numbers. Uh, four five race. Uh, we had about fifty people in that race, I believe. I think so. It was yeah. big field. Yeah. It was yeah. A good turnout for a local yeah. race. It was great. So fifty people in that field, and I was worried that um and and i knew that my skill level in terms of the majority of those folks i knew that it was higher however to there were there, there were a lot of people there were a lot of heavy hitters so a lot of yeah. people who would normally race the a's who just haven't had the upgrade points yeah you got guys with uh maybe multi-sport backgrounds but often mm-hmm. enough mountain bike backgrounds mm-hmm. and, and really good mountain bikers at that very strong fit athletes very yeah. capable but they don't have a usac license or, or you know maybe they just have a five because they've done a handful of races yeah, exactly or they're yeah. doing one days yeah so i i I was a little worried about the danger of riding with mixed abilities, so I didn't want to lollygag at all on the start. But then at the same time, I also wanted to make sure that I could pull the cream out of that or, you know, have the cream rise to the top, so to speak, by putting in a hard effort. So from the gun, there was a guy that we were that we were riding with Jordan and he was riding, uh, Nate and I and Jordan, all three of us were riding together, so to speak. Yeah, and he like said, a team. Yeah, he said he was going to go hard from the gun. And so my point was, all right, let's go hard from the gun. Or I'll follow your move, basically. And just before this, Jonathan told me, I'm not going to go hard from the gun. Well, <laughs> as in, I, no, no, no. I need to clarify that. I was not doing that on my own because my strategy wasn't to just go hard from the gun and see how it goes at the starting line. My strategy was to go hard with or follow Jordan's move, right? Because Jordan said he was just going to go hard. We got to the first turn. I looked back and Jordan wasn't anywhere. No, we so at started. That point, I recommitted. <laughs> <laughs> from, okay, from the back. There was a huge, there was a group of us, 50 people. Yeah. The, the race truck says, okay, take off. Jonathan sprints as hard as he can. Mountain he bike gets style. His, yes, yeah, he yeah. gets his power PR for the entire both races. <laughs> and and I do an expletive. So yeah. because everyone, people are like, Jonathan, what? And people are groaning and stuff. Like, what is this person doing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I expected Jordan to be right there on my side. He couldn't clip in. And he so, couldn't clip in. Yeah. So once I saw that, I recommitted though. And that's one thing I want to talk about is, is uh, the best laid plans or whatever else. Yeah, that we're plans are is. always flexible Yep, and, and usually useless. <laughs> and you have to, you have to be willing to recommit. And in that case, like I went right off the, the front like that, expecting to have somebody by me. He wasn't mm-hmm. there. So suddenly I went, what do I do in this situation? And what I analyzed was the fact that I thought, well, the pack isn't really, they don't look like they're eagerly chasing. So I'm just, I can sit out here and I'm going to hang this out for a while to try to draw people up to me rather than sit back to the front. Mm-hmm. So what I would have, um, I think something you could have improved on is uh, since you knew Jordan was going to go, just wet, let Jordan go ahead of you mm-hmm. and get in his draft mm-hmm. rather than, than take all that wind. And then if yeah. you were two up, you and Jordan, mm-hmm. it would have been even less work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and, and I think that Definitely, that would have been the faster thing and re- or the the better thing in retrospect. There's, oh, retrospect is but, retrospect, right? Yeah, but once I was in that moment and I had a good enough gap on the group that I was like, well, I'm just gonna sit out here and I didn't didn't cook myself or anything on those early laps. I was riding sustainably, you know, it wasn't too tough, so I just stayed out there and let them kind of come up to me. But it was really interesting to see that in that race, um, we maintained a pretty high average speed. And I think that's because there was some productive work going on as a group. Mm-hmm. And I, and I kind of want to, I don't know if it's too early to jump into well, this. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about, cause we're, we're going as teammates Yep. and Jordan and I are in the pack yep. and you are out front mm-hmm. and Chad, why don't you talk us through what should Jordan and I do if we got one guy off the front? And, and we're in the pack. Uh, it, it's a little more complex than that, simply because you and Jonathan are clearly on the same team. Jordan, you guys might, the three of you might be riding as teammates for a little while, but in, when it comes down to those closing laps, yeah. all bets are off. Okay. So uh, that com- just me, complexifies matters a bit, but you, your job would just be to cover anything that gets across to Jonathan. Mm-hmm. And so if you see something going up the road, I mean, all you do is mark it. You sit on that wheel of, you know, if it's a single rider, a couple riders, and just wait till it gets across. When it gets across, then it's up to you to decide what to do next. Do you counter it or do you sit in because you guys have a good enough gap and you can all work together for a while? And that's what, that's exactly what happened is people try to bridge to you mm-hmm. and I, I'd go on them and, and we did bridge to you like, I think three people mm-hmm. and Jordan was one of them. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went to go, I was up front and I was like, I was thinking of counterattack mm-hmm. now. That's, and then it was probably too early to do that. And, and that's what I was going to say. Like pretty much the, anything that happens in the first half of the race, especially with a lower level criterium, and I understand it's only a 30 minute event, it's going to come back. Mm-hmm. Not too much sticks when it happens in the first half or even the first two thirds of a race. Yeah. It's kind of tricky to do. The interesting thing was, I think that you're, you, so you were thinking, okay, we've caught him. 
now I should counter, which is usually what you would do if you're yeah, in a pack. Because I wanted right? you to have a free ride. I, w- I thought that these people would then chase me and you would get a free ride for a while. Well, let's be clear on one thing too, or let's clear something up initially. Uh, that Nate's out there to get starts. Jonathan's out there to get wins. Oh yeah, that's so a big that, point. That is mm-hmm. a big point. Because I'm a five mm-hmm. and I hadn't, <laughs> I hadn't finished a race. <laughs> I only finished it with some metal in my collarbone. <laughs> yeah. But the idea, uh, I get nothing by winning mm-hmm. and Jonathan gets a lot by winning. Mm-hmm. You get a point no matter what. You get first or last, you get a point. Yep. yep. That's it. I can so get dropped. You're... As long as you finish. As long as I finish. Yeah. So actually <clears throat> when we got to that point, I was about a half a second away from attacking and you said, slow down. I don't know if you remember that. Yep. Cause course. I was like, I kind of like started to put some power on. Yep. Um, and then I made the decision, well, let's just try to get this break yes. further and, on. So there's a difference, right? Um, in the sense that I was up the road and then you guys came up with a pretty small pack. I think it was like three other people, right? It was three total. Yeah. So when you caught us there in that situation, that's like, okay, all three of us might be able to work together to really get some good separation. Cause the rest, they were still pretty close. No, they, they were too far. I, see, I don't they think they were. They weren't. They were I don't about, think they were catching us. Nope. There were about 20 riders behind us and they were maybe three seconds behind, four seconds behind. They were pretty mm-hmm. close. So at that point, my thought isn't, uh, you know, if, if you're in a big pack, and your teammates up the road and that big pack catches him, then yes, as a teammate, you should counter in most cases yeah. on that. But if you are in a breakaway and then you bridge up to that teammate, you don't necessarily, unless that teammates, you know, no, at that point in the race, you're flag. fortifying your resources. Yeah. I mean, you're, mm-hmm. you, you're basically strengthening your, your, the possibility that break will stay away. So yeah. it's nothing you want to uh, mess with mm-hmm. or, or attack. So that's when I was saying like, you know, go easy, go easy to mm-hmm. not, mess up the break that it was we basically had. it was too early to uh to attack well, and since to we start the break. infighting i mean w- yeah. once you establish a break you guys work together until you have to start to break it up until, yeah. until the you, know, you come down to those crucial laps or you know one of you has noticed over the course of it that i'm taking stronger poles i'm taking longer poles i'm clearly the strongest guy here i'm going to sit on for a couple of poles and then i'm going to attack this and see if i can solo for 10 or 15 minutes or, or mm-hmm. whatever it may be the yeah. uh one other thing that happened is just after that i think no, it was before that. I forget when it was, but uh, I had my tire slice right in half, <laughs> yeah. and it was an explosion. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, "That's it. I'm not. Gonna, this is the second. I'm not going to finish a single <laughs> not even race. Start yeah. or finish." Uh, luckily, Chad was there, and we swapped wheels. And I think mm-hmm. I it was like a lap or something. We we did it really quick, mm-hmm. and uh, Chad missed his entire warm up yeah. because he didn't yeah. have a wheel. Yeah. I'm going to bring extra Chad. wheels next time. And uh, that's that's you if, saved if me, I can Chad. Jump in real quick. That's. Uh, how none of us did that, I feel very foolish. Right. I mean, it is a criterion, and I know when we go to Air Center, it's a local race. If you flat, you just kind of call it a day, no big deal. But this was a USAC sanctioned race. We knew that, that points were on the line. I fin- there was yeah. more motivation. We should have brought at least one extra wheel. Well, we have sure. extra wheels for me and Chad, yeah. the same wheels, and we could just yes. lay them on the grass. No, it's you, a short you, loop. You, you do your little TP. There's usually a little wheel pit. You duck in, you swap a wheel, you're back on the course, and, and that's yeah. it. Another takeaway, right? Yeah, yeah for yeah, sure. That was just foolish. You know, right after that happened and you flatted the group, it kind of like let some steam out of the group. Cause I think that they were like, Oh, good. Cause I wasn't here. Nate's gone. <laughs> yeah. So that means he's That's just, right. there's just one guy. But one, one thing I've observed with that is you didn't jump back in with the group that you left. No, I did. Did you? Yeah. It was, I, I was in the a, break when I, when I got it, you were, yeah. and then yeah. I saw you with a bigger, bigger group and you had to work back up to the small well, group. Jonathan mm-hmm. broke away. And the group that the group that I was in, I think, got bigger because it slowed down. So you yeah. did reintegrate with the same group. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's all I was going to get across. Yeah. So and and with that one, as soon as the steam kind of got let got let out of the group because of Nate's flat, we carried on for a bit, and then the pace started to slow down. And as soon as that happened, I I, I still I felt plenty tired, but I was like, attack! If we're going slow, I'm going to attack. You know. Yeah. So. And I, I went off the front again, and then that ended up causing another split. And then that really got things whittled down. And then mm-hmm. we really got separation from that group. So it was, it was basically a, like a, something that I usually find in a race is that if you're, you know, if you're looking for the time to attack, there are plenty of times that come from that. But when the pack slows down and you're racing with good racers, you'll see that if the pack slows down, if you're not attacking, somebody else is attacking. Mm-hmm. Uh, they keep the pace high to keep the race selective. And I employed that that technique in that race for sure, uh, especially because of the wide variety levels. I figured it could be more successful even than if one yeah, with, was you know, higher really riders. fragmented. Yeah. The last, the, just the last thing I want to say about this race is, so at the end, there were four of us, Jonathan, Jordan, and I really like three teammates against and then one other person. Mm-hmm. And that person, um, uh, we did a, Jonathan is very good at, um, he's very vocal in a break. He's 
telling everyone what to do. <laughs> not complaining, but vocal. Yeah, like I'm not the type of person that's like yelling at people and telling them that it's like uh, – uh, Do this. Nate's yeah, expression yeah. Do this. Exactly. Do this. Yeah, do yeah. this. Yeah. Um, well, there's a difference between people that are tired and yelling at people because they're not working. because they're cranky. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, and then there's a difference between – we need some organization. We need somebody to kind of guide this. So you ship. were trying to be the captain on the road. You exactly right. Well, the instigator. I, yeah. I think he was goading someone else too to do too much work. Which there was we, that too. Yep. So the one extra person in our group, poor guy. Um, he's he was actually pretty strong, uh-huh. um, a little squirrely, but mm-hmm. he he probably took too long of pulls. And then uh, after one of his pulls, Jonathan attacked hard, mm-hmm. and Jordan and I just sit on him. And he pulled to try to bring back Jonathan for like a lap and a half. Like yeah. we're doing 10 second pulls and he does like a 70 second pull and like strong, right? Even mm-hmm. longer. Yeah. I know. I was like thinking if he was smarter, he could maybe like do better. Yeah. Um, can I, I'll, I'll say the end of the race. Yeah, so, yeah. well, you guys, so you guys had effectively a three up break and you had one of your guys masquerading as someone from another team. <laughs> so that you say, poor guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> poor guy. <laughs> So, well, and, and something I want to cover really quick before we get into how it finished, but uh, I feel like there are certain tactics that with skilled riders, like are really experienced riders, don't work just straight up. Mm-hmm. However, yeah, depending on seen all this mm-hmm, a number of times. depending on their mental state, you never know it might work. And in this case, I just thought, you know what? I'm going to encourage this guy to keep pulling. And I know that sounds silly or that sounds even like no. you know, a bit evil, but the fact is he was doing a pull and I had said, good, keep going keep going and i knew that he was kind of on the ropes so you're, you're at managing resources at yep. that point why wouldn't you <clears throat> and then at that point i just told him to keep going until he couldn't and that's when i attacked so the other so at the let's say so jonathan he stayed away and jonathan won the race hey. right and then at the end um jordan they accelerated and jordan passed the the uh the, the, the odd man guy. out from our group yeah. and i i didn't even do a, a kick at the end because i said we well, have another race just, Literally right after, like 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 five <laughs> yeah, minutes after. Not even time to give me my wheel back so I could warm up. Actually, yeah, yeah. not even five minutes. I I did like a, a somewhat soft lap and yeah. then a I two minute lap and, and you line up went. and we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, the idea is in this situation that uh, the person who was odd man out, if he didn't pull really hard and he started to soft pedal because you know he he has a choice here either bridge up to Jonathan or start to like play a game with us Mm -hmm. is that if he was a soft pedal, then either Jordan and I would have gone Mm -hmm. really hard Mm -hmm. and then brought the next person. And then if he would have caught, then the next person would have attacked, right? Or just when there was no scenario for him to, it's to be successful in that situation. Yeah, Unless he was just so much stronger than exactly. That's the only one is so much stronger or we're done. Mm-hmm. Right. We did some, if we did something stupid, like if we would have just like kept an even you guys pace, bridge back to Jonathan and towed him along, mm-hmm. that would be something stupid. Mm-hmm. Um, if we, uh, um, just went an even pace and this guy was a great sprinter, mm-hmm. like that would have not been smart. Mm-hmm. Um, if we would have tacked like two at a time or something, uh, it could have worked, but it could have been a better chance for this person to catch on to a draft. Totally. Yeah. W- one person is, is, is just enough. One versus three is pretty tough. So, yeah. and I mean, but if I am that one person in that situation, I'm not doing any work. So unless yeah. I'm really it's not much point in it. Yep, because there's there's other people, and if they want to, and the three people, if they want to make a wor- breakaway work together, then they need to work together to make that work. Yeah. So know, so, so poor guys, <clears throat> poor guys, uh, approach at that point should have just been to sit on the two of the, you and Jordan. Yep. So, so then so we would have so attacked. The three back. So what? So, yep. so that he just covers that attack, yep. but he's got nothing to gain by being in front of you guys. Yeah. Exactly right. You kind of, it's the, you, the, you are the, not, you're obligated. SOL no matter what. Yeah. You're not yeah, obligated. So, so why not at least try to try to out sprint the two of you guys and get a second place? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. You're right. That would have been just trying to cover us two the whole time. Yeah. Would have yeah. been the better yeah. move. Even before then, when he got into the break with us, he didn't need to work. No, he, yeah. have. I just seeing the two of you should let him know I'm not going to do much work here. Yeah. Cause yep. we have the same Jersey on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one, too. one thing is after the race, mm-hmm. a bunch of people were like, that was so fast. That C race, it, it was the was. four or five race. And I looked at the data afterwards and, uh, Chad's race, the, the one, two, three race did, what was it? 25.8 average speed. Mm-hmm. The four or five race averaged 27.3. Yeah. Granted it was a half hour versus 50 said, minutes. They did so. 45, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah versus but 45. Yeah. Still. Mm-hmm. We 25. were. one eight or is that the three, four, five race? That's the three, four, five race. So it was a one, two, three race. The three, four, yeah. five race and the one, two, three the race same. had the same exact oh, okay, speed. Yeah. Same speed. Yeah. But see our, our, we can get into this in a little bit. Our race was different. It wasn't fast. It Very was hard. Very when different. we went fast, we went real fast. And then when we shut it down, you know, the, the, the average speed 
Somebody yeah, got the, dropped substantially. In the C race, they got the on Strava for the loop of the lap, the mm-hmm. sixth highest of all time. And it's up there with Justin Rossi and, and all those people. Who was in our race last night? Justin, Justin Rossi. Awesome. He's yeah, back. That's what I'm saying. Well, not really. He just trains once a week and he still hangs with everybody. Yeah. Okay. It's amazing. Three, four, five race. We line up. Mm-hmm. We go again. This one was a little more, a little more tactics. I was quite tired. I did not want to go hard from the gun. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jordan, however, did want to go hard from the gun, so he did. You guys only had thirty minutes in your legs. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, so I and I didn't. I, I want to be clear. I wasn't like exhausted, but I was. I d- definitely didn't feel like you know spring chicken sure. at that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So didn't want to go in and, and try to try to put a check out there that I couldn't handle later on. So anyways, I Jordan went far, went hard off the front and he had three people with him or two other people with him on different teams. And teamwork really comes into play in this discussion on mm-hmm. this race. For sure. Uh, this is all around breakaways basically because another yeah. breakaway happened in this race and it absolutely ended up being the decisive thing. Which on a really basic course like this is not the easiest sell. Right. So, and we'll talk about that maybe a little more in the the mm-hmm. one, two, three race. Yeah, for sure. So in this case, he had, uh, he had a breakaway with two people from two different teams. And then we got to a point where I was just kind of marshalling on the front. Cause I wanted to kind of cover for Jordan. And then one of the teams that's up the road had a teammate that was chasing him down and he was pulling the whole pack up there with him. The so the Audi team. Yeah. Yeah. So the, Usually when you have a rider up the road in a breakaway, yeah. you should not be working. You should not be pulling people up the road to them. Right. Yeah, but the, the, the bigger teams fall victim to the, everybody wants some sort mm-hmm. of uh, mentality. Mm-hmm. So they don't necessarily ride as a team. I mean, you get 10, 12 guys from the same team out there at the same time, their, their views are not going to be aligned. They're not all going to be working for one or two people. Yep. So it kind of turns into a situation where they might as well be wearing different jerseys. Yeah. And we, we, he pulled us pretty darn close, like close enough so that jumping across to the gap to bridge that gap wasn't hard at all. Mm -hmm. So he pulled us pretty close. And then I think he realized either that's my teammate and he didn't know that was his teammate or he realized I shouldn't be doing this. I think he pulled off and then there was another person. Yep. And when he pulled off like that, I, I think I, I told you, I said, He's not going to pull. Yeah, because the next person in line was another Audi teammate, mm-hmm. and we did we thought he wasn't going to pull at all, which he didn't. Yep. So you did the wise thing at that point. We, he kind of delivered us closely, and you bridged across. We, we both did. Yep, yep. In well, tandem. You, you initiated it, and I just held on to that wheel. Yeah. Um, and when you bridged across, I liked how you, you actually you picked it up hard very quick initially. Mm-hmm. And that's another important thing. If you're going to make a bridging mm-hmm. effort and you don't really want to bring a lot of people with you, no, you it's got to be a clean break. Yes. You don't want to be a, a welder who brings everything back together every time. Mm-hmm. I like that term, the welder. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been called a welder in the past. <laughs> but I, I was a purposeful welder, I think. I was working for teammates. But that, that was my job, and it right. it cultivated a high level of fitness, i got to say. So then two of us went up to join this breakaway. Now, here's something that if I see that, so let's say on the Audi team guy, right? So you have an Audi team member up the road in the breakaway. You have a teammate up the road then two guys on the same team start bridging up to that, I would instantly think one of us has to latch onto that at least. Anybody, everybody in that field behind you should have said, if I'm gonna do something, I've gotta do it now, because that's too dangerous, especially Mm -hmm. having seen you guys kind of run the the previous race. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you really wanna make sure if you have two teammates going up against one of your teammates in a breakaway, you wanna grab that wheel. You want to even bring, if you can, another teammate with you, because you, if you get into a situation where your teammates outnumbered then by, you know, a, a mm-hmm. fellow team, then that's really tough. And the uh, other unfair thing, we had Jordan up there in the group who so was really, we had three. <laughs> yeah. A teammate within a different Jersey. <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. Jordan cat five? Uh, cat four. Four. Oh, so yeah. he was after He's in, and, and this guy that we're racing with just to let people know, he's like, uh, I think he was on the junior Olympic team for biathlon. He's like an incredible cross country skier. Stupid big engine. Yeah. A ridiculously high maximum heart rate. Yes. So his pumper goes for it. I think he said his highest is uh, 230. That blows my mind. (laughs) He's like 185 pounds. Yeah. Like crit machine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, A really good racer. So, um, but that breakaway is kind of interesting because this one was a little different. When we got up to the group, the, the poles I noticed were kind of spiky and I heard Jordan already trying to marshal that. Uh, Jordan was saying, Hey guys, you know, not so surgy, keep it easy. And so I had this situation where I looked back and the group was gaining on us. Yeah. (laughs) And I was like, Oh, I'm going to, and I'm thinking at this point in the race, it's early. Uh, 
like, you know, on the C race, I was like, I'm going to go on a break. But on this race, I'm like, I want to pull this group because they're too close. Yep. And I was doing really strong, like, I was going hard on the poles. Too poles. hard. And too hard, though, for everybody. But I don't know if it was because you guys stayed on no, and we got the big gap. At what expense, though? I mean, early in the race, if you're beating these guys up with two hard poles, that's going to be of consequence. Well, too risky. Obviously... It worked out fine. Well, yes, but <laughs> retrospect, like it's it's it did, too but it risky. was risky. It, I think it worked mm-hmm. largely because the group behind was inexperienced, and mm-hmm. because there were some aspects of I, it that I feel like made in this fast. in this race, the group pulls for a certain amount of time, and if they don't catch you within a certain amount of time, the the wind goes out of their sails. Yes, it doesn't work in every race. In, in less Chad's experienced said. racers, sure. That's but everyone thinking, yeah. else, I mean, once you get into the one, two, three, or the one twos, especially, mm-hmm. you realize you never say die. So yeah. you, if, and, and here's the best way to do that. Let's say that you are worried the group's going to catch us. You don't just start making your pulls hard. At that moment, when you're in a breakaway, you're a band of brothers or band of sisters. And you need, to, you need to talk to each other. You need to work together. You need to make sure that everybody's on the same page so that you don't just go hammer at the front. So in that case, we were roughly holding about um, a 27 mile an hour average with our poles, which if you look at historical data on that course, I know that if you maintain 27, even in the A's, uh, what I usually race there. If you if you maintain a 27 mile an hour in average in a breakaway, that's kind of the breaking point. If you're below that, it's not going to work almost well, every time. We were less. We were 26, 26. 25.8, yeah. And we were getting, but we were getting to the point where 27 was like a. We were really close to maintaining 27 for the poles. Like we were getting there. Um, so, and I realized that people were hurting. The two other guys, they were they were hurting. Their poles were short. They were kind of stabby, and then the next pull would be short and not stabby at all, and it would be like just dropping speed off. So then we started doing this thing, and this is the thing with a breakaway. A breakaway is successful or most successful when this, then the speed can be consistent across the board, right, when it's not fluctuating. <clears throat> So when you have a rider that's either pushing too hard or not pulling hard enough, you get this re-acceleration that has to happen multiple times every rotation. That's pretty draining. And it can really start to drain you. Uh, The beauty of a breakaway when it's rolling smoothly is that it doesn't actually have to drain you a whole lot because you can just be really smooth and you're, you know, there aren't any sudden fluctuations or or accelerations in pace. So uh, I was trying to make sure that everybody was rolling, you know, smoothly through that group so then we could stay together, better our chances as a breakaway in the beginning of that race to kind of get a good gap. Yeah. Here's early, early in the break, smooth is best. No, mm-hmm. no, no argument there. As that, as the race evolves and get closer and closer to the finish, that starts to change. Make it selective. That's when you start trying to feel people out, taking slightly harder pulls, seeing if some anyone's coming unhitched, seeing if when they do pull through, it's a little weaker than it was last time. So you know you took something out of them. That's when you kind of start, kind of start to feel in the waters and seeing you know who's who, who do I need to worry about at this point at this late point in the race and who's who's of no consequence. So there was this midpoint in the race where we had such a gap. I think we had lapped most of the field. I, I you know looking back on the straightaways, you can't see the other group. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, the rotation aspect of it, and this, this is a good takeaway, is Jonathan, you and Jordan always pulled on the side with the tailwind. Mm-hmm. So in that situation... Not a, no, no, that's not correct. Well, uh, the majority of the time. If, if, if I... If, if, if I, would we pull, looked, I would pull into the headwind for the second half too. So, okay. Yeah. Well, in my impression, mm-hmm. on, the, on the backside, every time uh, at the about pretty much the windiest part to this corner... Um, I was taking the guy in front of me, he'd, he'd do a little pull in the wind and then he'd go off you know and do a short doing. one. Yeah. Exactly. I knew what he was doing. And then Jonathan was behind me, keep yelling at me to pull through. And I'm like, I don't want to pull through here. This guy's trying to put me <laughs> in the wind. No, and then he's I mean. telling he Jonathan's he telling the, the other guy, he's like, you rest, Nate, you pull through. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, yeah. why, why? Uh, so why, why were you, why were you why. saying that? Because there was such a gap. I was like, I should be Here's why. not doing that. We were two thirds or halfway through that race. And if anybody worked together and we lost a guy and we started to really s- suffer as a group, we would get reeled right back in. I've, I've had situations on that course where in a breakaway, I'm, I'm further than that. I actually get halfway around the course and I look across the oval and I can see the group back there mm-hmm. and they still end up catching. Yeah. You'd be surprised how quickly an organized group can shut down a break. Yeah, but yep. You guys are doing it perspective of the A race. Well, of course, this, but in this case, but in this case, we had a yeah. mixed we had a mixed group of people that could very well be that fast. Could and and we had so you had to you had to play it safe. And then the reason I was asking him to to skip poles, which he he didn't, 
And skipping polls, as long as, you know, there's communication in the group and you don't skip too many, but skipping one or two, if you're really feeling gas like that is good. And if you're a group and you're still trying to get away and make sure you stay away, it's something that you'd want to advocate for a week. <clears throat> yeah. You're trying to eke more utility out of him. You didn't want to mm-hmm. blow him up on just a couple polls, rather let him skip a couple polls and so he, he can be was worth cooked. 10 more polls. I honestly he think that ropes. any of us, the three of us could have soloed away from the group. I know you think point. that, but at the same time, we were in a group. We might as well try to work together. It's you know, and yeah, different it's approaches. Totally fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would have. So if we were if we were into the final third of that race, then that thing starts to change for me a bit. I would not be telling him to sit in. We'd actually be picking it up, and I'd be fine with harder pulls. Either the the other takeaway though is engineer it where maybe I'm pulling on the the uh, the tailwind each time. Rather than trying sure. to encourage me to pull in the, in the headwind, but still have the other people pull. Now, in the here's headwind. why I'm encouraging you to pull forward. You, every time he would drop the speed from 26 <clears throat> to 23, that's a pretty big drop. So then, when you would pull through, and when you would choose to pull through, you would pull it back up. And then the problem with that is that everyone would have to accelerate, and it would hurt mm-hmm. everybody. So yeah. the point of pulling through was to keep a consistent pace. Yeah. And, and it and makes sense. I mean, you put your strongest guy in the front on the hardest part of the course to totally. keep the speed steady. Totally. But I want to be fresh. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think that was a concern yeah. for Jonathan. No, and I, I was not, not concerned about your freshness. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, but it, the point is, in a, in a breakaway, if you have a rider that's slowing down or taking really soft pulls like that, uh, you need to be wary of that. And if you can just pull through instead of sitting behind him and letting the group's pace drop down like that, pull through and keep mm. that pace high. The other part is that I would peel off right before like this corner. And this is the corner where in the race before I've clipped my pedal. And so I'm, I'm, I experimented, like you probably saw me take the corner, like eight, nine, 10 different ways, all the corners, mm-hmm. some of them good, some of them bad. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to figure out where, how late and how early I could pedal through. But if I peel off on that corner, I would, and John saw me one time, I get gapped by like mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 10 yards and then I have to accelerate back. And not, the, the group wasn't going fast enough where I had to, uh, I'd get dropped, but it was enough to put it was extra damage in yeah. my legs. No, no, corners every... are tricky. Sometimes they bunch up, sometimes they stretch out. I well, mean, it, you can you can make up a lot of time <laughs> in corners if you really pedal through them. And, but, and all those corners definitely lent themselves to pedaling through. But it, it's harder though, if I'm saying is if you peel off like before the corner, like if I was in the line, the pace line in second place, it, it's a lot easier to stay and maintain momentum through that corner. than when you're rotating to the back and you're kind of like, you're, trying you're to in re-attach. the wind. You're, tr- you're in the wind, you're trying to detach, you're at a different speed than them, and you don't have the perfect line. Mm-hmm. So like all three of those things slow you down a little bit. Yeah. Um, it's just better to situate yourself for the corners that maybe you're not the best at, try to be in the pack or try to be in the pace line in the right spot to be able to max minimize your weakness. And for and something so something to fix that next time is to just simply talk, right? In the group, say, hey guys, I want to change my position because I keep ending up on this corner. And uh, I don't feel comfortable. I yelled at you. I said, I he's I'm keep pulling in the wind. I want to pull in this back. You guys are that communicative. I mean you can just make that happen without any words. You just yeah, slot back, too. you just skip a turn. You you yeah, can reintegrate at any point in that pace line. They're not gonna Jonathan got in my head. Because he kept yelling at me, and I was like, well, I shouldn't listen to him, but he is my teammate. Maybe he knows something I don't know, but maybe – but then so, I, I don't know if you heard me say that, like, he's always pulling me. I'm always pulling in the wind, or he's he's having me pull into to- the wind every time. Totally heard that and did yeah. not care, frankly. See? So Because <laughs> we were all pulling into the wind, and, and it doesn't matter if you're in the wind or not. We're in a breakaway. <laughs> you do this together. So, um, But it the the problem that I was seeing with the turns wasn't just when you were reattaching but you would let a gap open up into every turn. And I was wondering if you were, what we talked about, I think even last week about how Pete lets a gap open up into the turn. I don't know if you were doing that I was experimenting with how, like where that pedal stroke could be. Yeah. Um, If you do a little gap, and I did it right a few times where you do a little bit of a pedal and then you come in and you don't, there's no brakes and it's perfectly smooth. Yeah. And I messed it up about 35 times. I got it right probably four times, but (laughs) I'm getting better. Okay. So I thought that you were doing like the tactic, like we were talking about something that Pete talks about is when you have a turn in a criterium and it requires braking and reacceleration, oftentimes it's better to let a little bit of a gap open up before you get to that turn. And then you don't break 
So then that way you don't have to reaccelerate. And I, in an ideal world, you just coast through at a perfect pace so that you kind of reattach once they've accelerated. Yeah, and from experience, like previous laps experience, you know how that corner is going to react in most cases. Mm -hmm. So you can start to employ something like that. But until you've figured that out, you yeah. got to do what you're doing, just a bunch of trial and error. Yeah. And, and then even then, it's not a consistent thing. And it, so it sounds like you weren't trying to necessarily employ that tactic as much as just find the proper line so that you could be as efficient as possible, right? Yeah, and yeah. I did it wrong. It was, it was like... A, uh, experimenting. Yeah. You and know, and the yeah. interesting thing though, about that tactic with, with Pete's tactic is the fact that if in this case, you'd never break for the turns on this course, mm -hmm. right? There's no never. breaking. Uh, Unless someone cuts you off. Yeah. You pedal yeah, through you the turns. You break for that. You yeah. just get out of the way. <laughs> get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, you pedal through the turns. So if you don't have a situation where there is a big, uh, a, a reduction in speed and a reacceleration, then opening up that gap only hurts you because they're oh, not actually accelerating, huge. right? It hurts you. So it's, it's humongous. And that's one of my takeaways from the, the one, two or one, two, three race yeah. was that I don't, I don't have enough snap to get on things as quickly as I did last year. So mm -hmm. I haven't been targeting that and it's just not there. The neuromuscular activity, the, the response that I, ha I have trained in the past and have benefited from, which allows me to kind of whoop, 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 and I'm on yeah. as opposed to two or three times that duration at slightly less power and a heck of a lot more energy expenditure. So mm -hmm. when do you need that? When do you use that? I guess in a course like that snap. Like often, what, often. Cause I bet a lot of people just think of sprinting and <clears throat> yeah, any, anytime something jumps away, I mean, you can, you can feel moves, see moves in your periphery and you know, now's the time for me to go. I don't want to wait until it's in front of me and I see who, who else is latching on. You start to drive that speed up immediately and figure out where you're going to, where you're going to latch on to whatever may be coming by mm. or just something directly in front of you moves away. And when you have to take three pedal strokes to close that gap, as opposed to one hard surge, it's, it's, it's a far different consequence. Yeah, I, I noticed the is. same thing. Um, my, and especially, so I had a, initially, I had a good, strong, like short power like that, mm -hmm. but then repeatability as mm -hmm. like after the second race <laughs> and there's like 15 minutes left, yeah. each one of those gaps open. I was like, okay, Nate, time to not. <laughs> Just to figure this out yeah. um, is I'm looking at my power file with performance analytics on trainer road <laughs> and um, you can, I zoom in and I can see, you can look at, you can tell where the laps are and uh, 500 Watts, you know, for only for a few seconds, but mm -hmm. every time. And I guarantee you look at Jonathan's actually, you can just see looking at our, our data, his power is much um, smoother and much more compressed, right? Mm -hmm. And you look at mine and it's like uh, earthquake just happened, right? Up and down, up and down, <laughs> yeah. up and down. That's mine looks too. Yeah, yeah which is not the right way. Yours, yours looks that way for different reasons. Mine should have looked smoother, right? Because in, in the end, I was trying to, number one, I was trying to make sure that things were smooth. You were doing those harder pulls, but then also there was a point in that race. And like, this is kind of where we'll end talking about our race and transition to Chad's, but there was a point in that race where you did a very clever move. Oh yes. Since so, it was... Really, I think at this point, uh, the other two guys that were with uh, with Jordan, you and I, had kind of realized that the three of us were probably teammates. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> this, this is an important thing is the, the Audi guy, he was in the race. He had seven teammates behind him. Yes. Right. Or, or seven. I think there were seven behind him. Seven guys wearing the same kit. Yeah. yeah. No, no. They, <laughs> so were they, they, they weren't chasing. Okay. Um, yeah, that's true. We they weren't. Yeah. Well, they, they weren't chasing on purpose. And we were even saying, his name is Kevin, the Audi guy. He's not taking hard or long poles mm -hmm. yeah. and good for him because he's in a group with three team with three of us and he has seven people behind yeah, so what he wants to do coverage totally what i mean what he wants is he wants teammates to bridge up to him so that he has some kind of chance which mm -hmm. begs the question why that didn't happen well that see that's the that's so there's like i think different levels of execution they didn't one is don't chase your teammate and you hear that so much yep. but i think with seven people in that in this race they could have taken the three or four strongest people Mm -hmm. They could have all attacked at once really strong, not brought up the whole Peloton and uh, bridged up to well, us. Once again, yes. the, the reason you would have done that in that case also is because you have two Phantom Three teammates that are with that guy. Yeah. So at that point, he's outnumbered. So you yeah, want to. Yeah, but that's, that's super negative to sit back there and just wait for things to unfold rather than instigate it, rather than make something happen when you have seven expendable riders. Yeah. I mean, you could have. They, they could have fired off shots. Either it gets away clean or they shut it down so that you don't throw the field up. And that's the, that's the key point, right, is that if they were – and I think because we had such a gap, they would have – not one person could have soloed. Mm -hmm. If they would have worked as a team. Yeah, a but as soon right. as they see they don't give a gap, they shut it down, 
the next three go right away. Totally. Yep. And then the next, counter, they go counter, back counter, and counter, forth. Counter. When you have that many riders, why would you do anything but that? Got a yep. lot of firepower. Liven it up. Gotta exactly. Have, and they're fun. strong riders in that group too. And I also knew that Kevin um, in this group, so he's kind of sitting in. I know he can sprint pretty well too, based mm -hmm. on group rides that I've done with him. He's a tiny guy too, so he'd be nice and arrow. Yeah, and he's got sprints. snap, uh -huh. right? Yeah. So at four laps to go, um, I look at Jonathan, and uh, I think Jonathan's, Jonathan's in front. There's a, the, a guy who's uh, the, the tired guy, but pretty strong in front of me and then me. Jonathan comes over and I go, uh, don't chase, then counter. And I wait till my guy does a big pull and then I attack But hard. he did a Cantillara attack. It was cool. Like you just rolled off the front, which made everybody kind of which go. Which makes perfect sense uh, for the sort of fitness you've got What do we do? You. And then also, I think at that point, maybe the rotation had changed, but I was right at the front. So I could just block easily, mm -hmm. you know, when you went away. I didn't have to. I think mm -hmm. you rotated right back in, mm -hmm. which was smart too. Mm -hmm. So the idea being in this race, so I don't, I don't get points if I win. What I wanted to do was be far enough off the front where, um, or close enough off the front where they think that they can catch me, mm -hmm. but not, I don't want to get so far where they give up mm -hmm. and they say nothing. So yeah. what happened in the group after I attacked? Yeah, instantly, uh, smartly, the other two guys attacked and they attacked for about eight seconds and I was right on their wheel and then their shoulders slumped heavily. And they, they saw you on their wheel, right? <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And they were like, oh, okay, that's not going to work. And then they just sat on the front. And I didn't do a single thing as I shouldn't in that situation. Uh, you're up the road and you know, I knew that you were playing bait and I'm sure that they knew that too, uh, mm -hmm. that you were playing bait up the road. And I just sat there and we Curved. watched you dangle just in front of our noses. And I kept looking back yeah. and uh, a couple times they, tr I saw it look like one guy trying to solo like twice he did. to bridge to me. He did. And then I would pull forward then. And, and, and then I would come. So you, you were maintaining a really tempting gap. Ex ex the tempting gap, because what the point of this is to get it so that these two people are super tired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then once they do catch me, Jordan and or Jonathan can go. I understand. Mm -hmm. Something that's interesting when the other guy that was with us from the Velo Reno team, when he was trying to bridge up to you, after seeing his poles, I knew he did not have enough to bridge, right? Because his poles were very short, hard, and then they would drop off after probably two seconds. And then he would be, you know, kind of out of gas. Mm -hmm. So when he attacked, I would kind of move to the side of the Audi guy and I would pick up the pace a bit and he would kind of follow my wheel just so that that way, if he was somehow able to bridge, I'd be able to latch onto that wheel, but I figured he couldn't. So it's, it just, my point with this is the fact that every single time somebody takes a poll or at all times, you should be collecting data on everybody around you mm -hmm. and you should be understanding what they're doing, how they're riding. Mm -hmm. You're trying to learn how Formulate to your strategy based on what you're seeing in the, in the, com your competitors. Yeah. Like you have principles that you operate on, but you have to make sure you understand the context and that's, you know, figuring out the riders. So my, my, my dangling attack for the four laps, um, I did 322 normalized Watts and Jonathan during the same time did 190 normalized yeah. power. Or nice. my, 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 NP was 322 and his was 190. Yeah. So that's an idea of how it's much rest twice the work. Yeah, it was only like five minutes, mm -hmm. but. Five minutes at 190 oh, in the five race. Five minutes, five seconds goes a long ways. Oh, I yeah. know, but so five minutes though. I felt fresh. Exactly. And then <laughs> nice. I got caught with like one lap to go. I actually thought, I was like, if I make it all the way, I'm just going to stand right before the finish line and then <laughs> let you guys like do it. But, uh, Give me my wheel. but the, the, that was like, that was the perfect thing is I wanted to get, I didn't want to get caught at the very end because then there'd be a sprint. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so at one lap to go, I got caught. And then I believe immediately after you attacked, which yes. is the perfect thing to do. Yep. Yeah. As soon as you with one, or I guess almost two laps to go, like it was kind of like around there, we got caught and then I attacked. And then once I attacked, the other guys just like stayed right on my wheel at first, but then they, I realized that they could not hold it. And I was actually hoping to deliver Jordan for a win, but he said that he didn't have it. Didn't so have any punch. worked and, out. And so one person, the Audi guy got dropped mm -hmm. from that group, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, the Jordan was there and the guy that was trying to bridge up to you, mm -hmm. he couldn't. Mm -hmm. Jordan just sat on his wheel and then the came past him at the end. 550 yards came around him. No problem. Yeah. And they got the one, two again. Yeah, so uh, so mm -hmm. Jonathan won the race. Okay. Jordan got second again. Yeah. I believe you have enough points to upgrade. Jordan, Jordan also got enough points to upgrade. Nice. Uh, yeah. Very if successful. Can, if I can have a proud Papa moment here. And I know I'm not, I, I, I coach these guys in a very loose sense in that they use trainer road and, and, yeah. and we talk about this stuff and they're, they're coworkers. So it's, it's a, 
an infrequent occurrence to have somebody call their strategy before the race. I mean, basically Babe Ruth it. Just point at left field and mm -hmm. actually make it happen. Yeah. And these guys did it twice. They established a break, that break stuck, and they won from that break. And they did it two times in a row. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Now I'm think thanks thanks Chad. Part of it was uh we had really good fitness mm -hmm. and I think we did really good tactical stuff too. Like yeah. both yeah. of those together That's made it saying, really yeah. super hard. It's commendable. Um, um to beat. Last thing I want to say on these ones before we move into Chad's race, because there's a lot to learn from that one, is don't underestimate fields. Like this is a situation where like, sure, we won and everything else, but people come into like a, you know, a fast mountain biker goes over and races a cat five race or a cat four race. And everyone says, ah, it'll be easy. Just, you know, roll away. Um, but it's, those races, it's never easy. They're never easy. It's never easy. And those races, you know, weren't easy on our end. We, we executed well and we got them done, but, uh, it's not that easy. So just don't underestimate it. It's always good to make sure you come in with, you know, obviously good fitness, but also a good plan and understanding and how to make it work. So mm -hmm. your, your race was, was different, Chad. It was, it was still actually a pretty big group, about 30 riders, 40 this, riders. This is the one, two, three ride mm -hmm. race. Yeah. And really fast guys that they're the folks that I usually race with. Um, it's a fast group. And, but I was surprised that there were, uh, some, there were as it should be almost in every moment, there was somebody off the front and if a break got caught, it was countered, mm -hmm. but you, it was incessant. I saw you with early on in the race and I was like, Ooh, Chad looks like he's not feeling well. Yeah. But you did. <laughs> Sorry, Chad. So, I was not feeling well, <laughs> but you did so much work still. Yeah. And it yeah. wasn't, it's, it wasn't foolish work. Yeah. It's so you're forced to no warm up, Right. I, I mean, <laughs> Pete, Pete lend me his bike. He has speed plays. So I hopped on his bike and rolled around for about 10 minutes and then sat around for the better part of 30 minutes prior to the race. So let's just say I went into a cold. It wasn't the worst thing because all the other guys, like five of the six or seven hitters I was worried about didn't warm up either. So I was like, okay, fine. Level playing field. We'll probably take the first couple laps easy. Didn't pan out that way. After one lap, it, uh, it just shot started firing <laughs> and, and it was hard. It was brutally hard. I mean, yep. each of those laps, every time something would happen and I would try to close it. And like I said, kind of lazily close it. Cause I didn't have snap. I don't have snap. Every one of those was, yep, I'm dropping out in the third lap. Yep, I'm dropping out in the fourth lap. Yep, I'm dropping out in the fifth <laughs> lap. That's <laughs> negative thinking, Chad. It certainly is. But <laughs> but I had it in my head that I don't have a warm-up. I can't do this. Mm. And th those are the battles, and, and there will be many. You'll mm -hmm. face a lot of these, and, and you'll, they'll come at you from all sides. There are so many opportunities to quit. Mm -hmm. And the thing with quitting is you do it once, and it only gets easier. Oh, yeah. So, so as soon as you make that call, oh, I can't do this. I'm bailing out. That, that that habit starts to form. So don't do it. Mm -hmm. and, and especially you, you get on, you're on the ropes and you feel like I, I, I'm the only one hurting this bad. You're not. The field, a group of riders who's, who's off the break or, or maybe is behind you, things change all the time. Things come mm -hmm. back together. People fall off pace. You regroup. You get a little bit of recovery. You've got enough energy to make something happen. You get back up. I mean, things are constantly evolving. So just, just take heart and do not quit. Yeah, I noticed that because so there were there were breakaways going up. I mean, you were in one of those breakaways for a while. Um, you guys were chasing and doing. You were getting close to. And actually, you did catch. I think uh, the the little group that was ahead of you guys. Yeah, we nothing got away until the the cash premium. So yeah. there there was a lot of stuff that got up the road and then it brought back, got up the road, and it didn't matter if it had Rossi in it, Pete in it. I mean, guys who were putting out Dave. can sit at four hundred watts for long enough periods of time to break people. Mm -hmm. It kept coming back because a couple of things were working against us. It's a really basic power oriented course, and there was very little wind. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there was wind, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't long it enough really to, to really down. break things up. And for our race, especially the mm -hmm. later race, we didn't start till 7 PM a little after. Mm -hmm. So that, that changes how this works out. Things get away and they're not as threatening as they would be in high wind. People are more inclined to work and close gaps than they are when there's a really, and there's a block headwind deterring yeah. them from, from closing anything down. Once that breakaway got away, you were you and one other guy, Josh Rennie, another mm. really, f he's a good crit yeah, racer. That was a tough situation. You guys were basically the only two pulling the rest of the group and we, you got darn close we, to catching We them, had a five man group and Josh and I would take strong, long pulls. We wanted to close it. And every time mm -hmm. one of us would pull, we would actually close the margin. Um, the other three guys, and, and I do, sometimes I get frustrated at the point where I'll yell at people and crits or I'll at least yell to Josh and do a bit of cussing. And yeah. I'm not proud of it, but you know, pain <laughs> kind of has that effect on me at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's that whole all's fair in love and war and, and yeah. bike racing is war. So you ever catch me yelling at you? Do not take it personally. <laughs> as soon as we get off those bikes, you're my best friend again. I mean, it's, it's, it's not personal at all, but in the moment when we're gutting ourselves and three guys aren't working, 
But if I try to break away, they somehow manage to cover that break instantly. Yeah. Tells me they are faking it. They can do more work. We can yeah. close this gap. We can bring ourselves back up to that lead group and have a shot at a better finish. Yeah. And when that doesn't happen, laugh after lap after lap after lap, it gets downright frustrating. But maybe though, they that was what they should be doing. I don't think so. No, they, they didn't they, have we, we needed to close that group. Yeah. No, but I mean, so at the or end, gap. you guys did close the gap. No. I closed that gap. I know exactly. And they didn't have to do any work. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, I'd argue and, and that they finished no, but they 13, 14, and 15. Yeah. I know, but still, that probably gave them a better <clears throat> chance. No, I don't think so. No, I don't no, think no. so. I think Foolish they should have worked with us so that we could have brought it all back together yes. and a whole new set of tactics could have unfolded. Yes. So they did not end up, they did not end up, you guys didn't actually end up catching Pete and those guys. No, we, yeah. they, yeah, they did so on the, on the final straight. Yeah, you because know? I towed them up and shut it down within like I'm 50 meters of it hoping that someone else would take the reins and I could latch onto that. But at that point, I was too spent. None of those guys that were sitting on the wheels ended up beating any of the people in the group ahead. I think... None of them uh, did. I, that's true, but I think that they have a better chance of being fresh the whole race. Yeah. But the people ahead... That, that too is far, a, too, but, far but, too negative. But the people ahead are just... They were... Those... It's Justin Rossi, Pete Morris. Yep. It's like... Really, really good. So why bike would you racers. want to sprint against them? But they were dangling. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, it was, I mean it's, it's I, foolish. Well, maybe I don't know about those people, but maybe one of them is a good sprinter. They're not. Um, okay, but yeah. I'm just saying. In my brain, here's my choices. I could either pull really hard with Chad, get us all in one group, and be tired, yeah. and maybe get dropped out, or rest. Let's see what if Chad can never bring it back and be fresh when we're all in one group. It's yeah. like either way, we're in one group. No, I, and I get what you're saying. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There's that's the thing with bike racing. If you're trying to look for possible avenues of success, they're everywhere. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a matter of trying to find a possible avenue of success. It's it's finding the best one. But, and that's the thing. But I have a group of 15 guys. If we all get back together, they're looking at a top 15. I mean, that's yeah. all that was left. As opposed to sitting back there and and relegating themselves to a, a crack at 12 through 15th. Yeah. I mean, it's just, there are far more opportunities if we had brought that group back together. Totally. So many more options from that point forward that they can't exploit by sitting on and not being lazy, but, but not being risky yeah. at all. Yeah. I wish I was there with you, Chad. Me I do too. It would have been extremely Lewis, useful. Oh, yeah. Another strong hitter here. Oh. Yeah. We could have pulled them back. And we oh, would yeah. have, and we would have done it with probably 10 laps to go instead of two laps to go. Exactly. And you don't have much to do with it at that point, especially when the two strongest resources have been cooked. Yeah. So yeah, it's, spent. it's like, basically one thing that you can take away from all of this is that you're constantly, you're a fluid composite team is in a bike race. Like you're, you're constantly recomposing your team makeup, so to speak, unless you have, you know, true teammates in there. And even then. But you're, you're, you should always be evaluating the resources that you have, and you should always be trying to you know, weigh out the best avenues for success with that. You change those tactics. They change constantly. Um, it's something that you have to be kind of fluid with. And, mm -hmm. man, yeah, I think that with, uh, with crit racing in terms of making brakes stick and really you know, going hard and like we did, I feel like we had some, some tactics that worked out on our end. It's, it's, such a, it's such a tricky game that comes with experience, but man, it has to be one of the most fun forms of bike racing. And it if really people, fun, yeah. if you're, I know that people have a bad, you know, crits have a bad reputation for being super dangerous or other things like that. They don't necessarily have to be. Uh, and I would encourage people to try them out because you can learn so much about bike racing through a criterium mm -hmm. people in general. That yeah. it's yeah. Just you so want to work helpful. on your pack riding skills. There's not a better place to do it. It's than so a much fun. Yeah. So coming up, we have, uh, there's actually a time trial coming up in less than a month, mm -hmm. our final time trial before the real time trial. Yes. And then um, we'll, is... we're going to do another uh, criterium soon. At the, it's going to be an Omnium where we have a time trial, a road race, and a criterium. Mm -hmm. And that's not USAC, so we can all race the A's together. Mm -hmm. And so last night, Pete so got... I'm gone. Pete Jones I'm gone. No! Yeah, oh. I'm in Phoenix visiting We family. need you. I know. Ah, is family that important? <laughs> um, <laughs> darn it. I know. <sighs> It'll suck. Jonathan's good. I... That, um, anyways, uh, Pete got second last night. He was out sprinting at the line. Um, and, uh, by quite a good sprinter. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't a huge gap, but it was a big enough gap, like a bike length. Mm -hmm. Um, anyways, we didn't beat him yet, but really there was only two people in the race and you guys weren't racing together. It was kind of a, uh, a two train road people in the race. Mm -hmm. oh, 
You and Dave. Yeah. He doesn't even know, right? And, and you well, guys Dave work. has a different kit on. And I mean, we worked together with it. I mean, there was one period where I bridged up to Dave, who was solo off the front, and Pete bridged up to us. And I thought, that's it. We're, we're running this. But <laughs> yeah. people shut it down. Again, the, the wind wasn't enough to, to favor something like that. I want to just read over the power numbers since we're power yeah. based because people are always it. interested in that. Of course. Um, four or five race, my normalized power was uh, 312, AP 270. Jonathan, for the four or five race, your normalized power was 289 AP 270. Mm -hmm. So right there, that shows you I had about 23 watts higher mm -hmm. in normalized power, meaning I was more spiky. Granted, you're, you know, you're, you're heavier as well. And this is a pan flat course, but still, you know, you're accelerating. Yeah, the mass, I so. accelerated a lot more so. and you were on a break most of that. So I think that's another reason why you were kind of yeah, um, I was, higher average power than. Yeah. I, according to that, I was four, 4.4 watts per kilogram for that race. I think so. <clears throat> wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Um, I did uh, for the three four five race three four five race normalized power two eighty nine so less and I could definitely feel the four five race. Um, <laughs> AP two sixty. What is that total? Thirty minutes and forty minutes. Forty five. Forty five. Forty five. So an hour fifteen yeah. race. Hour fifteen. Solid. It's good for so criteriums. That's that's a good length. It was like one hundred seventeen uh, training stress for the race. Mm -hmm. um, and then Jonathan was so I was sorry two eighty nine. And normalized power in 262. Mm. Uh, so a big drop, about another what, 20, yeah, 20 watt drop from the previous race. And then Jonathan was 255 and AP 235. So the difference between those two races, where we had the same AP the first race, and the second race, I was 30 watts higher than him mm -hmm. um, in the AP, which shows you. And I think that's another, again, because I was doing. I was pulling in the wind, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Chad's one, two, three race. He had the most power out of us three for normalized power for that 45 minutes was 323 average power 291 pete so highly variable yep mm -hmm. well uh 105 1.05 yeah, it's about pretty, as variable, variable as my race was it but just 20 watts higher yeah it's, it's, it's a crit yeah it's um, variable pete though normalized power 256 average power 302 mm. which is crazy so yeah. pete put out 30 more watts than chad Although ended up right in the same group at the end, but it, Pete was a uh, Pete also weighs more than Chad exactly oh, by twenty pounds. By twenty, pounds. so that's probably a good probably a lot. Yeah, so a, probably not far off like between the two. Yep. You know, so, but he was also um, getting a lot more breaks at the beginning, so that could be some of the yeah. acceleration. Yeah, he kept basically tailgunning and sprinting past the field with a whole lot of speed. <laughs> so discouraging. And he rolls by. It sounds like a truck. Does that's everyone amazing. yell? No. On the left. On no, the left. We, we we know it's coming, and those. Cliff kits are so brightly colored yeah. that you don't even have to look. You just you, you see <laughs> you it hear? in the periphery, and you know uh, <laughs> someone needs camouflage. Like, <laughs> yeah, uh, right. Yeah, it's like four colored. kits kind of combined. You yeah. can't tell where it is in the field. <laughs> but um, Pete, Pete comes by with enough speed, and you know that he's got the horsepower to back it up. That it's very discouraging. I mean, you have oh, to yeah. you have to be oh, yeah. seated a couple wheels back and pretty refreshed to try to cover it. So, uh, why would <clears throat> why would uh, Pete? Do what you just said, tail gun, and then come by at a high speed. That, that's exactly it. Start, no, start from the back, and he, he can generate a whole lot of speed, which means he opens up a gap quickly. Discourages you. Yeah. When you see somebody go by you at a differential of like, you know, six, seven, eight, nine miles an hour. Yeah, whatever it's it like, is. It's like, oh gosh, like that's yeah, going to be really hard. And then also out. knowing from Pete's reputation and his build, you look at that guy and you know he's not just going to take a 20 meter flyer and sit out in front of us. He's going to grow. He's probably going to hold that speed for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I have to go faster than that to get to him. And then I have to stay at that to stay with him. Even in his draft is a mm -hmm. super tall order. Um, I just want to make sure this point gets across is Pete was doing that because he can, without doing a huge kick, mm -hmm. he can accelerate. And by the time that he's coming from behind, the time that he passes and people start seeing him in the field, he's four or five miles per hour faster than everybody else. At least. Or more. <laughs> if he were to do that from second wheel, <clears throat> people have about you know, they could react within a half a second or a second. Yeah, you want to you watch a rider's level of uh, inexperience, you'll see them break from places like second back or even the front of the field sometimes or at the bottom of a downhill after everyone's just sailed down the hill and is fully refreshed. <laughs> there are times where you attack and it may actually work and times where you're dooming yourself to something totally pointless. So I kind of attacked off the front after the guy did the hard pull. Was that the right spot in that situation? Or do you think I should have like tail gunned and done something yeah i think that you could have attacked from the back and it would have been now granted we were with uh, tail gun from the field or in the, the group the the tail gun the uh the breakaway you just mean oh, sit yeah. at the back sit yeah the sit back. at the yeah it's not tail, tail gunning. gunning you're like 50 riders back yeah, just yeah. soaking okay. it up yeah. so 
in that in that case, yeah, I mean, you could have, but since we were dealing with riders that aren't quite on that same experience level, it worked out just fine. Mm-hmm. But if you're with the A's and that sort of thing, yeah, that stuff doesn't fly. You know, it doesn't work there. <laughs> They'll bring you back it's in. State the question again. If so, in in the breakaway, um, I at, so someone in front of me, he did a strong pull, uh-huh. and I wanted to attack right then because I knew he was tired. That's a great strategy. I mean, if you know within a group of four or a group of whatever who the strongest person is, and you plan to do something, you want to do it when that rider is at his weakest. So out, you know, fresh off of his pull or her pull, that's. And he was the biggest it's X an factor time. in this case. So even though we didn't know he was the strongest, and I don't think that he was, he was the biggest X factor. Yeah, I thought he was really strong, so uh, and I was. I had his wheel. Yeah. Uh, yeah he's, if he's a threat and he's hurting you and you know that he's got some punch in there, then yeah. that, that you kick him when he's down basically. Yeah, it can work. Yeah. But in terms of, of just all out breakaways, it's very rare that a person rolling off the front versus, or attacking off the front, however you do it versus somebody that attacks it's from the back. It's too easy to cover. It's very yeah. telegraphed. You see it winding up. It's, you have to have a heck of a lot of snap to get away off the front. Yeah. And, and two, even then you've been in the wind for a while. It's not a good <laughs> yeah. time to try to break. Yeah. And to this, uh, what I think I did. It's like I did about 500 for 30 seconds. Yeah. So and it wasn't a huge attack, but I I I, I didn't want to have a. Uh, I I wanted to dangle. You know what I mean? Yeah. I yeah. think for establishing the break, the break it was a much bigger attack. Like when we jumped to yeah. to uh, get into the breakaway, that was a, looking at my power file. The spike is much much higher. Mm-hmm. Um, this is where data analysis is super helpful too, yeah. because you can see. You know, I did a 20 second break versus a 30 second, or I broke at 600 watts versus 800 watts mm-hmm. or whatever. And you can see what happens after that. Yes. Once I get away, sometimes it's out of necessity. You don't, you don't get to analyze it. You, you did what you had to do in the moment. But when it's a solo break and you're calling all the shots, you get to decide how long and how hard I break before I try to settle in. Mm-hmm. That's when the analysis is particularly useful. Uh, I, so two mistakes I did on the break. One is I was too spiky. I was by myself uh, looking at the power why are you so spiky by yourself, right? I don't know. <laughs> I don't probably know. the turns. I mean, you were probably losing speed in the turns and come accelerating out of them. Yeah, you were coasting into the turns when you were in the break. Exa- well, still, not in the break, but when I was by myself. That's what I mean, by, by, yourself, by myself, I can take whatever line I want. I can pedal through every turn. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't time trialing. I was... I don't know what I was doing. Well, yeah, but that, I that's been my smarter. point is like by your on your own, you were coasting through the turns and that then you would probably re-accelerate when you don't need to. The other thing in this race is I was getting cooked by the end of the field mm-hmm. and looking at my race file now with performance analytics now available on Trainer Road. Mm-hmm. Um, so subtle I can, with those plugs. <laughs> I can see that uh, the, the things that were cooking me, the thing that I did over and over again was about 500 watts for like 10 or 15 seconds. Yeah. I think I need to do a couple more workouts on Trainer Road where I look for something that's like that. We have a lot of them, anaerobic, that's yeah. spiky yeah. and repeatable. No, absolutely. We both suffered from that last yeah. night. It's I mean, a my, my training has at least included a little bit of high, high level VO2 max work. Yours has been- I've been like two VO2 max work. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you rode the way that we would expect you to ride and you rode very strongly. Very, very you, strongly. You right? had a really uh, <laughs> small quiver. There weren't a whole lot of arrows in there. I mean, but you used it well, which you I, had. I have yeah. tons of arrows, dude. <laughs> hey, you do, but they're all uh, same shape, they I guess. They could be bigger. Yeah, yeah, they exactly. could be bigger, stronger arrows that go yeah, farther. They could be varied. varied more arrows. varied. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've got, you're a predictable rider right now. It's tough to do the, uh, it's tough to train for the time trial. And for crits. Very tough. They're very, they're very different. <laughs> time travel was supposed to be next week, man. I was supposed to come back from vacation, get it out of the way, and just focus on criteriums. And, and then now we, I got to figure out how to extend time trial fitness for another month while racing criteriums. Well. But then we have, <laughs> we also have Lost and Found, which is a 100 mile cross like dirt gravel race. And then we have Leadville, which is a 100 mile mountain bike race. I feel like both of those races, I want to be super light for. We're all over the And place. have great endurance. Yeah, yeah. The crit, I want to be kind of like, or the time trial, I want to kind of be heavy with high threshold. And the crit, I want to be really super punchy. It's got like three. Got to pick. Da. Got to pick. Yeah. 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 It's hard. Or just be mediocre in all of them. I think I will be. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, not the worst thing. Let's get into some questions here. Uh, we've, we've, we, that was a big discussion on crit tactics, but hopefully people found it really I just helpful. want to say this I again. You. Jonathan won two races back to back. A it's four good. five and a three four five in mm-hmm. the fields of like fifty people each. Yeah, and I know a with lot threes of... in it too. I mean, great, yeah, jo- great yeah. job, Jonathan. Well, thanks, That's thanks how I got you. my three upgrade yeah. too. Just yeah. a couple back to back wins. And That's sweet. Yeah, I yeah, like you... that. And I have my first two finishes. Heck yeah, <laughs> top notch. Good thanks. stuff. Thanks, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one's from Steve. He says I'm on the organizing committee for Velo Sano. Uh, that's a ride that we we looked it up. It's got twelve to one hundred mile options, even a two day option. Uh, he says it's a benefit ride for cancer research at the Cleveland Clinic. It's, this is the fifth year for the event. 
We serve meals, including a rider breakfast uh, the day of the event. Most people don't eat the breakfast, so we end up with a lot of unused food. That would be a shame. It says, we discussed uh, trying to serve breakfast this year that is designed to give riders energy and easy on their stomachs. What do you suggest? Can you recommend a meal or a source that we can go to to help design the perfect breakfast for our event? We hope to have a few thousand riders. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Should I, Chad, why don't you talk about the stuff it should be, and then I'm going to describe the perfect breakfast because I've got it. Okay. <laughs> You're going to describe your perfect breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's yeah, the – it's the. Uh, okay. <laughs> got it. Um, so pre-ride, I mean, immediately before a race, so we're talking an hour out. Mm -hmm. the, your, your objectives are basically you want to top off your energy supply. If you're deficient in any way, get a little glucose in the bloodstream, whatever. Um, and you want to minimize in-workout muscle protein which or, or muscle degradation, which I think a lot of riders do not consider. Hmm. Um, that's certainly intensity-based, duration-based. Talk a little about Yeah, that we should actually minute. cover that really. Is that okay? Uh, I'm going to get to it. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah. And you want to feel good. So you don't want to put something in your body that makes you feel lethargic, that makes you, you know, causes any, any form of GI distress. So it's got to be something that works for you. Um, obviously carbohydrate is going to be part of that mix and probably simple. You're not going to want to dump a bunch of fiber in there. You're not going to want to put a bunch of car complex carbohydrate in there either. So, uh, but again, intensity dependent, um, mm. protein, like I just said, is a little less obvious. People don't consider the fact that there's actually a fair amount of muscle degradation going on over the course of a ride, um, with, with gentler, lower intensity, steadier state rides, not nearly as much as something like what we did last night. Mm. Criterium like that on and off again, I mean, all out and then easing up has, it has a much greater impact on, um, protein turnover. Mm. Um, and ideally something with a bit of salt mm -hmm. just to bump up your sodium stores a bit so that you retain water a bit more, you know, hydrate better. Yeah. Avoid dairy and fructose. Fructose both of which, is super, yeah, super and that's that's used. another. So so dairy, I think most people are on board with that. They know it's going to gum them up. They know it digests slowly. They know they get belches and and, and uh, just gas and mm -hmm. potentially diarrhea. A, a lot of the, a lot of undesirable things heading into a long event or any event really. And then fructose, everyone thinks well, fructose is good. It's fruit sugar. That's that works. Our our bodies have a very limited uh, capability when it comes to dealing with fructose, mm -hmm. much in line with dealing with alcohol. There are a lot of parallels there. Something <laughs> I would actually like to talk about in a later podcast. But the fact is, our bodies don't process a whole lot of fructose. I mean, uh, sports dietitians and uh, experts in the field recommend topping things out at 50 grams of fructose a day. Mm. On the high end of things, I see most of them come in more around 30 to 25 grams. Hmm. Again, our bodies just don't deal with it well. Our, our livers are where it's metabolized. That's that's where it goes. We don't. Uh, the other cells in the body can't use it like they can glucose. Hmm. And excess in the liver means fat on the liver, means uh, f fat storage. It leads to a number of undesirable effects. Hmm. So maybe hold off on the fruit and, and and fruit. Don't 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 let me give fruit a bad rap at all. But you know things that are obvious sources like high fruct fructose corn syrup, you know, cans of Coca Cola and stuff like that. These are things yeah. that are challenging on your liver and don't digest as quickly as simpler carbohydrates and, and glucose. What about like when we're talking about like the intensity and because I, I noticed yeah. like when it's intense and you have a big bunch of food. In your well, stomach, and see, see, there's tough. another mistake. Another trap people fall into is they think I have, you know, four five, six hours on the road. I'm going to eat a massive meal. Absolutely not. Still make it a slow meal or a small meal. You want something that moves through you rather quickly, and then you're going to nourish on the ride, mm -hmm. especially when it's lower intensity and you have the option of eating. And it's not going to be an all out sort of slug fest like yeah. a criterium or something, even a, a mountain bike race. Yeah. Can I share on that really quick? Something sure. that I realized during our pre-ride of the Segondo with, with um, <clears throat> Katarina Nash and Jeff Kabush. I don't know if you realize this, but before I swear, before they even unclipped, they had a bar in their mouth or they had a cliff block in their mouth or they had a goo, something like that. Like they were so good at eating during the ride. I don't know if you noticed that. I didn't that. notice like, it, but I believe it. They're mm -hmm. so good at it. And I've noticed the same thing with Keegan Swenson, Pace and McKelvin, all these guys, yeah. when they are riding, they are eating and they are drinking. It's a steady stream of, yep. of intake. And it's, and they don't eat as massive of meals outside of that. Yeah. Like, you know, before, you know, they're, they're breakfast, lunch, dinner isn't crazy big, but what they do is they know that when they're on the bike, they're constantly eating, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's something Your muscles that, have on board what they're going to have on board going in. You're not going to mm -hmm. pack anything more in there on the fly. Active muscle doesn't, doesn't store glycogen. Mm -hmm. So it's basically about utilizing that, but supplementing it with exogenous carbohydrate, you know, food coming into the system, stuff you eat to, to keep things topped off as much as you can, you mm -hmm. know, based on how, how hard you're working, you can only get so much in the system, but you know, mm -hmm. over something like that, they, they obviously have learned to manage it really well. And to start the refuel process sooner. 
totally. Yeah, yes, yeah. sure. And yep. you might not go as low on your glycogen stores if you're getting if you're eating all these carbs the whole time. Totally. Correct. Yeah, which when you run out of glycogen stores or run low on them, yeah. things get dark. Um, yeah, real dark. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Chad, what would you have as far as like so, a breakfast? I, I have a preference too, so I'm not going to say this is right for everybody, but yeah. I think it's right for a lot of people, and it's definitely right for me. Is uh, rice with a bit of scrambled egg in it. And often enough tortillas, depending. Yeah. So, so pretty simple carbohydrate. I mean, flour tortillas. So basically, what I've described is a breakfast burrito, mm-hmm. and it works well. They actually keep well. That you can reheat them later in the day. So, in the case that they have a ton of food left over, I think that was something they, they yeah. don't necessarily just have to ditch. Oh, that's a good I idea. think in that situation, I do white rice, right? But the scrambled egg, I would almost do like a scrambled egg bowl with that. Because you want to make sure too, you you don't get too much scrambled egg because mm-hmm. then it'll be too much fat yeah, and you too don't much need protein. Much egg. Yeah, no, no, the rice mm-hmm. and the egg. I mean, I think of it like pork fried rice. There's not a ton of egg in it. Yeah, but just a little bit, right? Yeah. that's a key mm-hmm. takeaway. Mm-hmm. And then tortillas too. Um, the flour with gluten it's, could it's help some fat. people. And tortillas are kind of high in I fat. Recognize. That's why I, I'm a little carbs. reluctant on the fat. If it were a high intensity event, I probably would not have tortillas. I would just have a rice and egg bowl. Mm-hmm. But with something of this nature, why not? Why not give that, that little rice bowl, a little yeah. carrier to put in your jersey pocket? Sure. And okay, here's the slow absorption a bit. <laughs> here's the meal for a race director doing it for like a thousand people. How many gotcha. people was it? 500, 400? A few thousand. A few thousand. Your main, your main thing is grits. <clears throat> You're doing huge pots of grits, which are corn based corn. and they're super carbs. They have a little bit of protein in it. It's like, I think it's like 30 for a cup. It's like 33 grams of protein or mm-hmm. sorry, 33 grams of carbs like two or three grams of protein, like a half a gram of fat. And then you do- You also have a fair amount of fiber, which is my <clears throat> No, concern. it's very, it's it's like a half a gram of fiber. Huh. It's almost no fiber in grits. Dep- a different type of grits then. Oh, yeah. the, you can get you can get grits that are almost no fiber. Okay, well. cool. Good. And then you have a station where everyone walks their bowls over and they can put salt on it. They can put cinnamon. They can put honey in it. They can put brown sugar. They could do raisins if they want, um, cranberries. You could have like- Sunflower seeds or sliced almonds if people want that, just to like mix it up a little bit. And everyone can make it taste exactly how they want to. Mm-hmm. And the super crazy people like me can just do like honey and grits and some salt. And but other, other than, people won't I eat like, it without other I, stuff. I feel in like it. all that stuff would encourage overeating. It just sounds like if I put a bunch of honey, a bunch of cinnamon on, a bunch of brown sugar, I'm going to have a bowl and then I'm going to want maybe another bowl and I'm going to go into it <laughs> yeah. far, too, I mean, his, far too loaded. His up. problem right now is that most people don't eat any of it and they have a lot of unused food. <laughs> That's um, a good point. Yeah. I, don't, I do really don't people think... people eat all the food or do I want to have a successful in, event? Important part, <laughs> bowl size. Yeah. So if you get a bowl that's the correct size, you can even tell people if you're really concerned about it, you get one pass through. That's it, yeah. right? And you can limit people to whatever. Tell them they got one pass, carbs. and they're going to heap that thing as full as. They I know, can but get the bowl it. only gets well, just like switch grits. Jer- switch jerseys with their teammate or their friend for a while. And come grits back. when they're cooked are like soup, right? Yeah. Um, so you can't you can't heap it too. There's a limit to uh, how okay. much you can do. So they're pretty viscous or uh, non-viscous. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So it's not like you put like more water in a cup, right? Okay. There's a limit to gotcha. how much you can do. Right. But for in terms of cost, the things that are not the grits store really well the raisins and brown sugar but then the grits too are so cheap and it's really easy to make huge pots of it Mm -hmm. right and it's just water and then the instant grit stuff yeah it'll be it it digests super fast too and it's almost Mm. all vegan there i mean honey isn't vegan but like you'd be able to if if people like and you can make it vegan a few thousand people somebody can easily make that vegan they can deal with different dietary things that they would want to avoid really easily i better make sure grits are gluten free but i'm almost positive and we should probably talk about with something we've mentioned a number of times but these are all things you try beforehand and it's not like you can totally try everything a race promoter might throw at you on race day so yeah. sometimes you're going to be subject to, to surprises but you can kind of if, if there are options nail it down to you know you know, look at the table and say i know that works for me i know that doesn't so it, yeah. it's helpful but try this stuff in preparation for your event and it's not to ensure that come race day you're not going to have some form of gastric distress because there are I mean, different hormones firing at, or yeah. occurring at different rates on race day. When we yeah. get wound up in anticipation of a race, you may find something that you've eaten every day in training that has never caused any issue at all. For some reason causes an issue on race day. Yep. So two more. Um, I just looked it up. Some brands of grits are uh, gluten-free and some aren't, mm. even though there's no um, things in it that would have gluten. They're just yeah. not considered it. Gluten-free metabolizes a little more quickly too. So that. That's something to weigh into that, it. That's what you want here. Depending. Yeah. Yeah. Two, as a race director, just on Chad's point now, I would say ahead of time, on race morning, we're going to have grits and these things. Yeah. Sure. Like, say the brand, because then if I'm uh, Ironman athletes do it, marathons totally. do it, they yeah. know what's on the course, so they can train that way. Absolutely. When we, uh, I was in Bentonville, Arkansas with Todd Sadow, the guy that runs Epic Rides, mm-hmm. and when we pre rode the course, he was still laying out much of the course, and we actually had some of the food sponsors with us. Mm. Uh, V8 was one of them, and some others, and he was like, 
I think we're going to have the aid station here. We'll have V8. We'll have this. And he was naming off the nutrition that they would have. I think that's a really good idea for race promoters is to, to know beforehand what you'll have at the aid stations and then communicate that throughout. Yes. Because it's a huge deal. Like, I hate it when I show up to an aid station and, like, we carry so many sweets with us a lot of the time and I want something savory and they don't have anything savory or they just have orange slices. Oh, that's you know? a <laughs> distinct responsibility of any yeah. race promoter is to tell you what the aid stations are going to be composed of. I hate it when it's like a sponsor is goo or a cliff bar. And then the first, like other cliff shots here. No, those are in aid station seven. Yeah. I'm like, what? what? I would have like yeah, exactly. right here is just uh is just drink and something else. And it doesn't say just a water station on it. And yeah. or here is just uh, apples. Something yeah. like you don't want to eat yeah, and yeah. Uh, in water. Yeah. Uh, it's tell us and please, or have them all. The best is have them all be the Consistent. same and all fully stocked. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I and think that's two, as a sponsor, <clears throat> they want you to tell everyone. Like if Cliff Bar is sponsoring it, oh, yeah. tell me six months ahead of time what's going to be at each station so I can start buying these products. Totally. And using them. them out, seeing how they work. I remember. Yeah. I remember Liz Lyles somewhat begrudgingly drinking Gatorade when she was training all the time. She's like, oh, "This is what they'll have on race day." Yeah. Got to get used to it. You know yep. what I mean? It wasn't like a drink of choice, but that happened so much with triathletes. Um, yeah. They had the Gatorade high endurance, which was the higher salt version. Yeah. It all buy that because that's what's going to be on course. And you got to get used to that because for some people it messes with your stomach. So they tried oh, yeah. to like acclimatize to it. Yeah. Or is it? No, acclimatize. I don't know what the, that's the wrong word. You know what I mean? Yeah. Get used, get used to, to, it. to it. Hey, thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's close out with Tom's question here. If you are with us on the live stream, by the way, stick with us. We'll answer some of the questions you've submitted. Uh, he says, I'm 25 years old and based in the UK and have been cycling competitively, competitively for about a decade. I do a bit of road racing and time trialing, but my, my primary focus is hill climbs at the end of the season. This UK hill climb or TT hill climb stuff sounds fun. It's always in so October, much fun. Those, right? Yeah. It's the so month of October. Fun. I like uh, the four to five minute. Well, I'm giving it. We should get yeah. that here. We should do it. It gets too dark too early. Maybe on the weekends. I don't I know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mornings. I think it's always in the morning when I see it on the weekend. So. Uh, he says hill climbs are popular in the UK are typically of around four to five minutes in length and are pretty much a pure VO two max effort. Ding, ding. Yes. That's the bread and butter sessions to prepare for these events will obviously be some sort of VO two max, uh, hill repeat style workouts around twice a week, depending on how well I'm recovering from the previous week. My question is regarding what to do between these VO two max sessions. Do I keep it all at zone one to maximize recovery or should I keep up the base miles? So I assume when he says base miles, he's talking about more like zone two stuff or tipping up, you know, around there. Uh, he says, and take a more 80, 20 approach base miles would maintain aerobic fitness and would help keep my weight down, but they could harm the quality of the VO two efforts. Not likely. Cool. So let's get into that, I guess, Chad, these four to five minute hard efforts. So basically, if you don't live in the UK and you're thinking about this, but you have downloaded the app Strava, you do this all the time anyway, because yeah. you chase four to <laughs> five minute segments. So this applies to a lot of That's folks. like most segments too, right? Oh yeah. Not many like hour long segments. No, no. Yeah. yeah you're, you're like one of the only people I know that targets those types of That's segments. because they're, they're not as competitive. <laughs> <laughs> There's only three people up there. I'm pretty sure yeah. I can beat them. That's clever. So uh, what should they do, Chad, in this, in this type of scenario? Um, so what, what were the assumptions we were going to make? I know yeah, I mean, it's four to five minute efforts. It's, so we know that, but, race. but how much time do you have to train first off? So anytime I see polarized, I, I feel like telling people you got to have a lot of time to train. Mm-hmm. You can only polarize your training if you're going to be able to, that, that 80% it has to be a lot of time. You yes. have to accumulate a lot of base. So if you're a time crunch rider and you're going to do 20% of your VO2 max work on a six hour weekly budget, you're not going to, it's not going to pan out. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to assume he's got a fair amount of time to train. Yeah. Yeah. So that he can truly 10 hours, polarize 15? the training. Sure. Fine. 10. But um, the, you're, you're basically training for what, what would be a track pursuit, right? Four to five mm-hmm. minute full on VO2 max. So big anaerobic contribution, but also a really big aerobic capacity. Yep. Um, it's, it's a very specific effort. So in, in because of that, you can spend your base period targeting what we'd normally target, which is just lifting your, your lactate threshold via sweet spot work and mm-hmm. is, is our preference. Mm-hmm. And then maybe dabble a bit in VO2 max work with the shorter efforts. When you move into a little closer into your build phase and you start doing obviously some more VO2 max work, where it gets, you have quite a lot of options depending on your time budget is when you get into that specialty phase, you can do your, your two VO two max workouts a week and, you know, mm-hmm. do like a Tuesday, maybe Thursday or Friday, depending on how long it takes you to recover. And then just really 
if you flog yourself for an hour at a time, hour and a half doing VO two max work, you're not going to have a whole lot of energy to do much, but race by base, ride base miles. Mm. That's all good and fine. There's a different approach <clears throat> and you can, especially when you're specializing and, and trying to get really specific to your event is do many short workouts over the course of a week and intersperse it with two a days or just shorter recovery rides. Mm -hmm. um, when, when you do just a couple, that leaves room for that long ride on the, on the weekend, maybe a long base builder mm -hmm. where you're still targeting aerobic base. You're just doing it from the lighter side of things, lighter, longer side of things. Um, but when you, but if you don't want to do that, if you don't want to, you know, beat yourself up for those two events and then just do a whole bunch of base mileage riding, you can do like 30 minute workouts where you do two or three VO two max intervals. And in your case, I would target those four and five minute durations to mm -hmm. familiarize myself with them and to lift that particular power duration and then spend the rest of your time. Maybe you, know, you do those in the morning and then you do an easy recovery ride in the afternoon or, or the evening. And then the next day you can do it again. You can yeah. do quite a lot of those shorter, highly intense workouts and build a, a really good specific type of fitness while spending the rest of your time accumulating low intensity aerobic mileage. Yeah. Another thing to think that we um, are assuming here is that someone's already had like a full season mm -hmm. because if you do the VO two max approach, like there's a limit for rewards, right? You can't just do it for yeah, a year you, round. Your, your body is going to stall at some point. I mean, the, your adaptive resources reach a point where they can't adapt anymore. Hmm. So, so you can't just do, you can't just heap VO2 max work on VO2 max work and expect a, a continuous improvement in, mm -hmm. in, in your performance. Yeah. So at some point you reach a wall where, where the damage it's doing to your body is kind of even with the, the stimulus, the adaptive stimulus that you're pushing on it. I've read that that's like six to eight weeks kind of. It, it depends on the athlete, but mm -hmm. yeah, that's pretty typical. Yeah. And that, that said, that's not to say that, you know, just using VO two max work or doing a VO two max workout, you know, a long way yeah. before your this event is, like is a, a bad lot. idea. Yeah. We're mm -hmm. talking about like a really concentrated approach. Personally, you even see like on our base build and especially VO two max work has a place year round as yeah. far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. yep. except in transition when you're resting. Yeah. I mean, in, in the early parts of it, they're, they're short, short intervals with, you know, probably equally long recoveries. I'm a big fan of 30 thirties cause you can do a ton of them mm -hmm. and they don't take this massive toll on you, but they prep you for those longer efforts. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then you move into, depending on which direction you're going to take things, longer efforts, uh, maybe you get into five minute jobbers down at 102% or you just do more of those high end 30% with shorter recoveries. You know, it, it all depends how you're going to shape your uh, your desired performance. Yeah. The, and the, I, when it gets really concentrated, you know, that's when we're talking about where that point of diminishing returns comes in, you know, where yeah. it's, you can um, only do anything for so long before your body just fails yep. to adapt to it. I mean, you can only heap so much stress, mm -hmm. even base mileage, you know, if you get yeah. up to a point where you're doing five and six hour <laughs> rides, typically, I mean, then moving up to seven and out eight hour rides, isn't really practical for yeah. a lot of people. And what sort of yield is it going to actually, this is, this you'll is be super good at ba basically riding with a broom wagon at that point. <laughs> that's I'm going to say something you have. <laughs> super inflammatory. Okay. 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 But this is how I feel um, of you CrossFitters who do uh, endurance stuff. Too much intensity. Because they do just, it's almost all VO2 max, and they get this amazing Initial increase. Boom, yep. boom, and yeah. then it kind of plateaus, and they never get to get any faster than that. And you kind of have to like rebuild your they fitness. They stall. Exactly. They yeah. stall or they get injured. And, um, you think that because you had that initial thing mm -hmm. was so great and you think, Oh, I just got to do some more. Yeah. I just got to do some more. Just got to ride that wave. Yeah, exactly. And do more and more, but it doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> initially, especially CrossFit ha had the, the reputation of just beating you up every time you worked out. And for whatever reason, people didn't like the day on day off. They would just want to go every day. And I, I fell into that trap because it's actually really quite fun. Yeah, so you want to do it every day, but your body is not going to let you do that every day. So yeah. you have to build stress or you have to build recovery into it. And the better uh, CrossFit gym box owners do that these days, um, it's, it's, it's come past the point, And I think they've recognized that people start to break down rhabdomyolosis was not an uncommon term to hear in a CrossFit box. <laughs> that is completely wrong. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It shouldn't be that way at all. And what's that? Cause I'm sure Rhabdo, just like total, total it. cellular breakdown. I mean, your body, I, I need to review it. It's, it's, uh, the extreme end of things when it, it's, it's like, uh, overtraining syndrome times five. And like the protein gets in your, uh, bloodstream or your liver and yeah, it can be very, it can actually sort. kill you. It can kill oh yeah. You. It's, yeah. it's horrendous. It's pretty gnarly. And stuff. It's funny, it wasn't a really a common term until CrossFit came around. And that's that's it, exactly yeah. my point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it became rhabdo. It should not be part cool. of your common <laughs> but it's, vocabulary. It's almost like a, uh, badge of honor. They have shirts that say it. Yeah. That's like, yeah, can that's... you imagine cyclists saying that shirts that's like overtraining syndrome? Yeah, bro. With an exclamation. This is awesome. Chasing OTS. Yeah. 
chasing OTS, right? Yeah. You're not trying unless you're OTS. Oh, that would be so funny. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I've, CrossFitters. I think we're, yeah, I think we're You too, look better than me. Yeah. True story. And, and CrossFit can be done they really smartly. Us, it can yeah. be. Yeah. Just be smart about yeah. it, right? watch, watch all the guys in CrossFit games. It can be done really smartly. Yeah, so VO2 max work um, employed intelligently can be done year-round to great benefit. And in a concentrated manner, you can see a lot of gains as you're coming into something like this. Remember that like with this sort of work too, and this is something that you've always hit home, Chad, when you're trying to really focus on your ability to your power at VO2 max and increasing that, it's not necessarily about repeatability. And in this case, since you're just doing one time yeah. trial, yeah. you don't really care you're about your ability to... to punch again. Yep. yep. You're a one-trick pony. Like make sure yeah, you just have exactly. that thing really strong. You know? Yeah. So in this case, then would it be a lot of, um, the 30 on 30 offs, but also some workouts that are kind of like exactly four to five minutes in length, maybe build it up. From Absolutely. Two. Once he's in specialty, I, I don't know that I would have him do much else than that. The short yeah. workouts would be two or three of those. If you had like, only, only want to do twice a week, longer workouts, it'd be five or six of those. Mm -hmm. So really challenging. And then probably a lot of rest between intervals. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's fresh coming in each one? Yeah, completely. I mean, th there's no reason for him to train repeatability if he's going to go out there, do it one time and call it a day. Yeah. yeah. And the point of, I believe, Chad bringing up the 30 on 30 off thing is because you can get in so much quality work at VO2 max or something like that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, it's a really low toll way of accumulating time at a high percentage of your VO2 max. But it makes your train road workout look super brutal. It when does. When it gets uploaded to Strava. Yeah. Kudos all day. Right? Yeah. It looks like, <laughs> oh my, how did you do that? But really? They look pretty mean, but I'm not, I'm not going to pretend they're easy. Yeah. They're, they're not easy, they're but tough. they're not as hard as I think. 30 30s. Intervals. I'll tell you 30 30s. I get to a point where I feel like I could do those all day. It, it, right. it becomes a time constraint. Right. You can do so many 30 minute repeats at, you know, uh, 30 second. Yeah, 30 second repeats <laughs> with 30 seconds of recovery. I mean, that one to one rest recovery ratio when, yeah. when they're that short, I mean, you get up to three minutes and that one to one doesn't, doesn't allow you to go as far, but 30 seconds on at a time, you can do so many of those things. Yeah. The, yeah. some of the workers I'm thinking of, they're blocks of 20 minutes of that. Jen Darm, all, all the versions yeah. of Jen Darm. I, I, so you're stronger than me, but at the end of those, like the three or four at the end, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm ready for the rest. Yeah. I do not feel like I can do them forever. It depends. I mean, when you get down to the 20 second and 10 second recoveries, I'm yearning for the end of those sets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's a good point. Okay, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast. If you're with us on the live stream, stick with us. We'll answer the questions that you've sent in throughout this podcast. And we will be talking to you next week. I believe that we may be actually coming to you on Friday of next week. Uh, we'll let you know um, beforehand. And uh, we'll take it from there. So thanks, everybody. You submit those questions at trainerroad.com slash podcast. We'll talk to you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Jonathan, question for you. Okay. So if you can upgrade and you have the points, mm -hmm. are you going to race the the next USAC? We only have, I think, one more this year. Mm -hmm. Are you going to race the one, two, three, mm -hmm. three, four, five? Mm -hmm. You're going to race both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why not? So you're going to try to win the, I guess, just win the three, four, five. Could we can upgrade you to a two maybe? The point would be to win the three, four, five, and then to – see if it's see possible to four, hang five. in we used to do in masters one two, one, two three threes. races race them fully i mean with the intention of winning mm -hmm. and then jump in the p12 race right afterwards mm -hmm. and you don't you know have super high expectations for that p12 race but you get a lot of good work, work in mm -hmm. well, our strategy might be because jordan will be in the three four five two mm -hmm. so i think I'll, I'll i'll still do the four five maybe i can try to win depending on if there's any teammates try to win that one and then just yeah. try to work really do pull in the wind each time yeah. on the uh, three, four, five. <laughs> Not concerned with that, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan says he you. doesn't need me. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm saying I'm not concerned if you're pulling into the wind for me. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> wind, not wind, as long as you're pulling. Um, okay. Let's see here. Um, Good people liking performance analytics. Somebody asking if we'll be incorporating metrics such as CTL, ATL besides TSS. Um, Kathy, sorta. There's a so the idea, the idea behind those metrics are um, uh, managing your stress so that you can get maximum performance without digging yourself into a hole and peak the best for a race. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that happens great without having to explain to hundreds of thousands of people, what CTL, ATL is, how e for each person it's going to be different. Yeah. Um, and then also how the amount of the kind of stress that you get in a workout is going to be uh, different. Yeah. So like, can if, I touch on that really quick? Yeah. I see so many people just focus on the balance that they have their TSB, basically the balance between the two. And they forget about the 
quality or the specifics of the work they're doing because they're mm -hmm. just trying to hit that number. They're just chasing big CTO. And I just they show up on they show up on race day thinking that because their TSB is in the right spot that they're like okay. Bam, I'm ready to race, but they forget the fact that it's they don't have the ideal preparation. In the live stream that we did, I fell in this exact same trap, just trying to hit 400. When I did 400 of um, sweet spots, some threshold, uh, all like train to road workouts, mm -hmm. I was very strong. Three, like I think I was <laughs> right. a legit 345. Yeah, and I got some sick, and then I did a whole bunch more with a lot more outside, like just longer. Because you go outside, it's way easy to get 200 TSS or 180. Mm -hmm. You just got to totally. be on your bike for a long time. Yeah. Um, getting up through interval workouts is a lot harder. So we the idea – for that. What? We want to account for that. Those exactly, Kathy. Is I want to – the idea is we want to make um, as fast as you can for the race. And I think that we can do something better. Like to just put CTL, ATL on our graph today, like we could have that happen right now today oh, yeah. i could go in another room and have someone do it and we have it up today but i think there is a better approach that we're working on and so it takes a little bit longer but i think you'll be a lot happier with it and um i think it, it'll be it'll just be better I so agree that's with that. that's why it's not there so, today hang and in if her. it's coming and if we did have it yeah this is it's a little ways out though so don't we have ambitious plans but mm -hmm. if you do it uh if we did add it today i think that it would just be confusing for the majority of people. I agree um, with that. Like it's, 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 I think even today it's confusing for a lot of people who think they know it, they, yeah. it can still, it can also give you false, as Jonathan's point is, totally. um, false positives. <clears throat> yes. Uh, you think you should be doing something. You think you're great when you're not, or you think you're not great when you are. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If you, yeah, it's just because you have a data point doesn't mean that it's valuable. In fact, it can be misleading. Yeah. Uh, you don't so, want that. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see. Do you have one, Nate? Uh, Jared said, is Wednesday a live podcast date? Uh, no, we're just doing it today because of John, uh, Chad's Travel. vacation. Yeah. I should have known beforehand last week and warned you all. I'm sorry about that. It was my fault for not looking ahead further. Um, let's see. Uh, I bought a pair of tri shoes. Any advice for biking without socks for fast transition? Um, triathletes don't use socks, not just for faster transition, but also I assume for water and just like wet foot. And that's no, mostly thing. faster transition. Yeah. Just faster transition. Mm. Um, do you find that there's any problems with using cycling, like blisters or anything else? Wait, the question was those? for better socks for fast transition. No, bought a pair no of tri socks. shoes. Any advice for biking without socks for oh. fast transition? I think that his intent is to use it for fast transition, but tips for biking without socks. I've never had a problem biking without socks with any blisters at all. It's really like socks are optional. I think yeah. when cycling. Mm. Only problem is when um don't tell a, a, a persnickety road cyclist that one they'll lose their mind right but if yeah. you get on um and the shoe too is made to not like a tri shoe is made to not wear socks so yep. it should be it shouldn't be like jagged edges on the inside or anything like that big difference compared to like the S work shoes that I have that have like basically sandpaper on the heel cup like <laughs> if I didn't have a sock it would tear right through my skin I think that's it not was, good yeah um and then on the run I've I haven't found a shoe and it's been a long time since I've done that but that like they say that they're like a sockless shoe, but I would just get huge blisters and I would only do it for like a really important race, like a sprint hmm. where it was really important. I would just say, okay, you're not going to be able to just run for a few days. With the foot trauma. <laughs> yeah. Later on, you wouldn't really feel it during, but afterwards yeah. you uh. would. And I found, I like the, for socks on the run. I like the Belega. Belega. How do you spell that? B -A -L. Do you know? A-L. It's, it's really popular. It's they're from South Africa. Hmm. I kind of wear them all the time now. But a tip is you kind of roll them up halfway so that when you do put your shoe on, it's, it's the getting the toe in is easy. These are ankle socks okay. and you just pull it around your heel. And it, I think you can do it in the socks so five seconds. on rolled your up halfway through in transition already. Yep. You're saying Smart. and they're ankle, right? So they they don't have to go like you can imagine our swift whisk socks for cycling, really hard to put those on. Yep. You could also use ankle socks like this on the bike. Mm -hmm. Perfectly fine. Um, it, 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 it's not cool, but no. it, uh, no, but, but it if you want, matter. exactly, <laughs> yeah. um, it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah. So if you have a concern with getting blistered while you're cycling, you could do that same kind of like running ankle sock, yeah. roll it up halfway, put it around. Um, so it's probably more concerned whether or not you can run without socks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and really you're going to have to put socks on at some point. <laughs> why not put them on for the bike also, and then leave them on for the run. Only if you want to get in a pack. Ah. So mm -hmm. if you, if there is some kind gotcha. of drafting and you're in the front of the sure. race, if you're not in the front of the race, it really doesn't matter. Okay. Um, and for longer races like Ironman, and uh, we see even pros, 
they go as far as I don't want to be in my cycling bibs anymore. I want to put on running shorts. They do a complete change of clothes mm. because mm. the gaps are so big in Ironman races yeah. um, that it's better to be more comfortable and not get a hot foot. Like yeah. for a sprint to 5K, your gaps fine. are big. And for the, a marathon, the race durations are long too. Exactly. But remember, even at the pro field, like, oh, yeah. You, it's like four or five minutes between pros when they come in, yeah. um, sometimes longer. Yeah. I was seeing some, uh, some folks who were criticizing Tim O'Donnell for taking too much time. I, I forgot at which Ironman it was, be, like, too much time in transition. And really, he was on par with the guy that he was right next to, but he just, you know, he took his time to put his socks on. He did those things. And I think that there's also a lot to be said that perhaps he's mentally resetting or he's getting mm -hmm. some composure in that. It's moment. rest time, really. Like it's important. Putting on your socks, you're not running at that time. So even though it takes, we talked about this last time, even though it takes maybe, let's say, five seconds. Yeah. Which really isn't that long, maybe 10 seconds. That could deliver a whole lot more later on. Yeah. And, and you have five seconds of rest during that. Just think of, we talked about intervals and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Getting a little bit of rest helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one of 10 seconds of putting a sock on prevents a blister. I'm pretty sure oh. you're going to be. Yeah. Faster because of it. Yeah, totally. I'm sure. Uh, day or drew says, do you recommend going from a build mid volume plan to a specialty high volume plan or should I just stick to mid volume? Uh, drew, it really depends. Like the volume that you pick, uh, really depends on how much stress your body can take. That's like the main thing, right? If, if your body can sustain that, sure. Um, secondary to that is if, you know, your schedule allows for that sort of thing, but it's less about like the high volume, giving you a better preparation for the event, because if your body can't take that much stress, it's a worse way to prepare for that event. You want to just pick the volume that, you know, your body can sustain. Anything else that you guys have had on that? Yeah. It's no. not to say that you can't tolerate more stress. So the, the jump from build to specialty sees a bit of a decline. We go from, you know, build being at the high point and then specialty typically tips down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So maybe you see that as, as a risk you're running and that you're going to lose fitness because of it. Mm -hmm. So if that's the trap you're falling into, don't, don't, don't concern yourself with that. And we're, we're finding fitness when, once we get into the specialty so that the base has been laid, it's been built upon, and now we're going to make it highly specific. So just because there's a decline in TSS, don't let that weird you out. Yeah. If however, you come out of that build phase and you feel like, no, I can handle a lot more stress in this and continue to get it faster. That would be a case for jumping into a higher volume plan. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Carlisle says, just re listen to the opening seconds of episode one. Dudes, you've improved a lot. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> I man. Think of those. What did he say? Just what? <laughs> just listen to episode one. And he said, oh, dudes, I wish we could make those disappear. <laughs> we can. Yeah. Can we? Sure. Why? We you guys should, should delete them all until I came on. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, man. Shows There's quality content in there. And oh, so much evolution. Better. We get better. <laughs> you've gotten better. Uh, <laughs> um, Alex asks, he's looking at my ride file on maybe Strava, but also you can look at all of our ride files. We should, we need to, we're going to have a better podcast page. So you can actually look at all these files. Yes. Um, mine is trainer.com slash career slash Nate. Uh, yours is trainer.com slash career slash Lee Jonathan. Yep. And Chad's is trainer.com slash career slash Chad. Yes. So we should take Jonathan from whoever has it and give it to you. John, I think, yeah, I think that I did. I just picked that one to keep it consistent with my presence all throughout the internet, but I wasn't, uh, I think that Jonathan might be there. Um, Alex is looking at it though. And he said that, uh, he thinks my heart rate is really steady. And what really happened is, uh, there's someone else in the race who's a trainer oh, user right. who has a heart rate strap that I have previously paired to, like mm -hmm. we share equipment here. Mm -hmm. So I pick up his heart rate and I think on maybe on Strava, although it drops out, it still shows that I have like it was there. Hmm. Um, if you look at my race file on Trainer Road, you can see it's just there for like a couple it's bleeps not when I lap. Your data. Yeah, it's not my data. So I need to really unpair that from my Garmin. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, Jared says, I've been pretty slack in my focus training for the last month or two, just one or two rides a week. Thinking about doing the 35 mile Carson race. That's the Carson City off road. We're going to be doing that one too. Uh, in fact, actually, we'll be doing a live podcast from there like we did for Cross Nationals. We'll be on the live, like the main stage before the headlining band of the weekend. <laughs> With fancy athletes. Oh, yeah. do we know who the band is? Uh, not sure yet. Last mm. year they had Greta Van Fleet. I know. It was pretty I amazing. It. Yeah. In fact, Todd said, yeah, we got him when they weren't, weren't big yet. He's like, that's hey, not going to happen again. again. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, that window closed. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they built up fast. So uh, thinking about doing the 35 mile race, should I do four weeks of sweet spot base or four weeks of the build plan? Honestly, if you say you haven't been consistent in your training, I really do recommend doing some base work or just do the base. I mean, it's sweet spot work. You need to talk a sweet spot base one. I'm yep. guessing. Yep. Yeah. And if you're feeling really ambitious, you can maybe start with sweet spot base two. Yeah. 
but it's it's going to give you more benefit i feel like it's going to be less of a shock to the system and that race at carson is not going to be like it was last year with surges the 35 mile route especially you don't do ash to kings so you've got like even more consistency it's going to be like a that power file will be smooth for a mountain bike race uh, yeah. comparatively speaking i'd say sweet spot base too cool um travis's question about uh dual-sided power meters with bluetooth uh, right now, we only pick up one of them. We have an issue it's being worked on to pick up both of them. If you want them to be picked up right now, uh, do the ant connection. Because mm -hmm. I believe, I, I'm almost positive the ant then goes through both pedals and then gets reported. So uh, gotcha. I'm frustrated. Power meter companies, just they should pair them to each other and then send us one number yeah. rather than so do two number Because there's connections with Bluetooth on Windows that are really hard. But anyways, yeah. that's coming. Another I question for mm -hmm. you, Jonathan. Cool. Would you opt for wheels with Chris King hubs or silent lower friction, I think it's Onyx hubs, Onyx, Onyx. Onyx hubs, uh, which are heavier. So yeah, the Onyx hubs are heavier, but they have some really cool stuff where it's like, it's darn near silent. Um, they have some magnets that they use that actually pull the poles or pull the star ratchet kind of designs away from hmm. each other, the poles. Why would you want it silent? Uh, on mountain biking, you'll be amazed at how much more in tune you feel with the trail and what your tires are doing underneath you when you don't have free hub noise. I know that sounds silly, but it does make a huge difference. It's just, you can like, there's a lot to perceiving traction that comes through the sense of sound and it can help a lot. Uh, so that's helpful, but not helpful for hikers. Um, oh, you, know, yeah, you, sure. your... you can sneak up on riders and races yeah, yeah, way true. easier. Some you of could. those free wheels are crazy loud. I think the Chris King hubs, they, they have a buzz. They have a, a notable buzz. And I think it sounds cool. It does sound cool. Sure. Don't sounds get me cool, wrong. Yeah. The, the one thing I'll say about Chris Kings that they're extremely well made, but they still, they're, they're kind of an, they're kind of an older design. Like they, that you have cones that you have to adjust. Um, mm. you have like things that, you know, you don't have with a DT Swiss hub or anything else like that, or you don't have with like an Onyx hub, but uh, the Onyx ones are a bit heavy. Um, I, I know that I heard a while back that they had had some durability issues, but I, I, I've, I don't, I haven't heard anything else. So I assume that they've been resolved, but I think that silent hubs is the way that we're going to go because silent also means less noise means less drag in the end, like, mm -hmm. uh, that drags or that noise is coming from drag. Yeah. So if sense. we can get away from that and then have truly free coasting, then we're gaining free speed. Chad question for you. Um, can you name some 30, 30 workouts in trainer road? I know you did it before, but let's just say it again. Um, Jen Darm and, and many versions of it where I yeah. trimmed down the recoveries, but mm -hmm. I think they're all 30 second efforts. Yep. Um, I think clouds rest are 30, thirties so. Taylor, Taylor, Kier Kiersage, maybe, although I think that might be anaerobic. The great um, thing those, is those are a few. If you uh, go on their website and you choose VO2 max workouts, mm -hmm. and then uh, you can you choose the duration. You could even, uh, in the search box, I do this all the time, put 30 slash 30. Oh, yeah. There you mm -hmm. go. Yeah. That's the best. Yeah. And then I would click VO2 max and then type 30 slash 30, 30, 30 yeah. and then you'll be really set. Mm. Lars asks, how do you get a workout when doing a NICA practice? That's uh, the high school and middle school league. Um, I don't know if you're talking about Lars being a coach and how in the world you get a workout in when you're trying to, to round up little chickens all over the place. Uh, if so, it, it does not work. You don't. Um, you don't. And you have to prioritize the kid's safety and you do your workout separate from that. However, if you're talking about how to do a workout with a group, we've talked about this a number of times, but with the kids, you got to keep it fun. Like, um, uh, you know, we've done everything from like relay races where they pass the CO2 and they have to put it in the Jersey pocket of the other friend with them. Um, we do things like we've done scavenger hunts with that. Um, we've done fun things like, like different skill practices too. Like I think that the kids ride so hard a lot of the time that they get a lot of hard work. Mm -hmm. You don't have to Takes worry about them not going easy. Mm -hmm. So if you keep it fun, uh, it's going to be good for them. And, and, Honestly, like it, it, I think that there's a lot to be said for not making it too serious for these kids too early on. It's, it's really fun when, you know, if they can actually learn to love riding and then they understand the benefits of, of good fitness and specific training thereafter or through somehow throughout that process, I think that's the best way, especially with a little son that's like striding six out. He has higher TSS than I do. Wow. He rides the bike for like four to six hours a day. It's absurd. So. <laughs> but is he doing intervals? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, Kids I have him on the rollers intervals. already on the um, strider. Jeff, this is for you, Chad. Jeff says that in uh, his local town, they have a Tuesday and Thursday night crit. Yeah. Ooh. And he's asking how should he rearrange his week for like four rides a week yeah. uh, so to be able to do that. And right now he does a – just a long weekend ride, yeah. but he wants to do a little bit more. How would you manage that? He's, he's on a race and recover sort of uh, approach. 
her training schedule. So honestly, what that weekend is is going to be is going to base. It's just going to depend on how much you, you know, slay yourself during those criteriums. I mean, you can do a Tuesday and a Thursday race and come into the weekend completely wasted, mm-hmm. um, maybe at a higher level of fitness or just a different, you know, maybe ran the race a little differently. You weren't as aggressive, whatever, come into the weekend feeling pretty good. So I don't know that I would slate it all out. And if I did, I'd be very flexible in what I did when it came to the weekend. If I came to the weekend pretty shattered, I know I would know that all I'm going to do is base work this weekend. That's a really good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, here's how I would think of like the best case if I wasn't super tired. So Tuesday crit, Wednesday, early in the morning, I would do pet it, uh-huh. just kind of easy, sure. but still get some aerobic even, benefit. Wednesday night. And then, because I want to have more time before Thursday's it's crit. Yeah, but I mean, something like pet it, you can, you can squeeze that in whenever. Mm-hmm. So Thursday crit, mm-hmm. Friday, optional, like uh, Taku or something, mm-hmm. 45% FTP. Yeah, just spin out the legs. Yeah, real easy. Saturday, structured sweet spot work, maybe like 90 minutes. Maybe. Maybe, it depends yeah. if you feel great. Yeah. And then Sunday, do your little longer ride. Monday off, do it again. That's a good schedule. Yeah, yeah. and that's that's pretty much if I were to it's like mid volume put plan. a training plan up on it is <laughs> it is the mid volume plan. That's 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 what it would be. Yeah. Um, but mm-hmm. again, it, how thrashed those two criteriums leave you? Mm-hmm. A sweet spot work on Saturday can just be the the beginning of the end. Saturday, so Saturday could be a day off or pet it. Yeah. Or again. or maybe you do your long ride on Saturday and then just call it on Sunday. See how you feel. Maybe yep. do a recovery ride on Sunday. Maybe you feel like you can do that sweet spot work on Sunday. Yep. And then Monday the off again. Yeah, Monday always yeah. off. I mean, in that case, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Going into Tuesday with uh, another workout in your legs isn't going to be of any benefit. I think uh, this will be the last. Uh, we'll do two just to close it out here. Um, first from Erica. She says, what kind of road tires are best for wet conditions? Wet conditions, and should they have some tread? Uh, road tires don't need to have tread or relief in there on a road bicycle to be better in the water. Uh, you can't – hydroplaning on a road bike is quite difficult. We, did, we didn't cover this, but in the Criterium yesterday, we had a bit of rainfall, so we all dropped our pressure. I think Nate and I both did 85 PSI mm-hmm. in, what, 26-millimeter tires? Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm running much narrower internal width than I ran mine at 85, and, and I and usually was, run the I loved higher. it. By the way, the wheel that I got from you mm-hmm. was a much higher pressure than the previous wheel I had. Oh, really? Yeah, so I think you <laughs> might have – 85. No, it mm-hmm. might have been 87. I tested pressure right there. With the gauge? Uh-huh. Oh. Yep. You, the tires Maybe it was that, the tire. The tires that you were on leak like crazy. And they're supple. Also, yeah, they're really supple, so yeah. they feel really different. I could just feel the bump, you know? Yeah. Really? yeah. Um, so you don't need to have relief in there. Uh, it's not like you have a broad enough surface area like a motorcycle tire or a car tire that hydroplaning is going to happen. That's why you want relief to channel the water out. With the bicycle tire, it's not gonna. You're not gonna have to worry about that. Um, so yeah, when just, it goes, it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I say sticky, sticky, sticky. The S Works Turbo is uh, the stickiest tire I've used. It's incredibly it's confidence too. inspiring. It will not last. Yeah. Um, but I would Expensive. say that yeah, go sticky. The last one's from Steve. He says, "How common is it to break saddles? I've found two breakages in the past few months. Is it because I'm putting out so many watts?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> he says, "One of the saddles is only a few years old." Um, uh, it's not common to see a broken saddle. Yeah. I've broken one. Not in my experience. Yeah. But it was a plastic one. So the... Over how many years of riding? Mm, two. Yeah. So that's... And that's uncommon right there. Like, it shouldn't happen. Um, a couple things to check. Do you have oval railed saddles or do you have round ones? Oval are usually carbon rail ones. And in many cases, if you have a seat post, you might have to actually buy different clamps or rail clamps that are made to better fit around an oval housing rather than around. Uh, so like Envy, for example, if you have an Envy seat post, you do have to do that. Um, but then, uh, so that's one thing to check. Always use carbon paste. Even if you have aluminum on aluminum, use the, the and I should call it friction paste because it's not carbon specific, but use friction paste on your seat rails, absolutely. Then always use a torque wrench on your seat post bolts. It's always worth it. The other thing that I see is that if people have their seat positioned poorly in relation to how they actually sit on the bike, you can put a lot of leverage on that Mm -hmm. saddle and then cause a breakage issue. You can really crank those down too. The the clamp bolts on the rails. Oh yeah. Yeah. So if you have your saddle, let's just say like you sit, um, you have your saddle slammed all the way forward, but you're still sitting really far forward on that. That's going to put a lot of stress on those rails because you're putting a lot of leverage on Mm -hmm. it. So, uh, if that's the case, then look for removing a setback seat post and going for a zero offset, for example, something like that. But the the best way to make your seat po- or your seat or give it the best bed of lasting is to be clamped somewhere in the center of the rails, if possible. Bike fits obviously the most important thing here, but 
make sure it's clamped somewhere in the center um, of those rails. So if you need to change your seat post or do something like that, that's the best thing. I um I broke the saddle right in the middle of where you sit. Oof. So it was like cracked in the middle. I've mm-hmm. done that on a specialized mm-hmm. one before too. Yeah, I think that's a combination of wear flex. and uh, kind of plopping down too hard. Yeah, I, I, at the beginning of... Uh, Sagan's Grand Fondo. Mm. I had a creaky saddle and I figured I just need to tighten it down. But it turns out the little bolt that one of the two bolts that holds the saddle in, in its uh, tilt position, yeah, yeah. or tilts it, had uh, worked its way out. So, so the last hour, I didn't have a bolt. Ooh. I had a very mobile saddle. <laughs> Risky. <Yeah. laughs> um, it just uh, hitting home on the dangers of this, a uh, friend of mine, he races for uh, Yeti. I believe he's a Yeti employee. He went off a drop on an XC course. Oh, don't say this. And he had a no. carbon railed seat post no. and it snapped. So it didn't get any bad spots, but it did go into his leg. So oh. that's, that's a bad spot. That's, that's a bad yeah. spot. Any that puncture could, you be have worse. A, uh, could be worse. Major artery there. You do. Yeah. This is true. So, um, so yeah, anyways, it's a, it's a, it's something to keep in mind. That's something you do not want to fracture. So, uh, make sure that your saddle is all set. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, Like I said, I believe that we'll be back next Friday. Keep your eyes tuned on our Facebook page because we are going to have a Facebook podcast, an Ask a Cycling Coach podcast uh, group on Facebook where we can all join in and we'll have regular updates through there and everything else. So keep your eyes out for that at the latter end of this week. And uh, we'll be able to keep you guys all in the loop with that sort of, uh, with the direct communication there. So stay tuned and we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.